Really excited about the team, about this group that we have together. I think that having everyone, you know, another year around one another is going to be big and being a little bit more comfortable with one another. I think it's definitely a different mindset trying to prove people right than trying to prove people wrong. Very talented club. The first sign of a good team is, is pitching and defense. We're a very close knit group. We have a lot of guys that we have a great relationship with each other. I think everyone's just hungry for this year. And like I said, whatever happened in the past don't really matter. It's time to win, and we all feel that way. It's definitely a, a sense of urgency to kind of do a little bit more than we did last year. Ultimately, the work that was done this offseason by players, I feel like, puts us in a really strong position. The wait is over. After a long, cold winter, Blue Jays baseball returns on the, under the sunny Florida skies in Dunedin, Florida. The fans are ready, getting their right, we're ready. First game. Go get them. Hi, everybody, and welcome to TD Ballpark. I'm Ben Shulman alongside Buck Martinez. And Buck, after a disappointing end to the 2023 season and not a ton of changes to the roster headed into 2024, what is the mood and the energy around the team right now? Well, Ben, the mood around baseball is always optimistic this time of the spring. Everybody feels good about their chances, but I think specifically with this Blue Jays ball club, they understand they have to be better. 89 wins a year ago and that was only good enough for third place and of course the disappointing finish to the season in the wild card series against Minnesota. They didn't run the bases well. They didn't have a good clutch hitting team. They've got to be better at scoring runs without hitting home runs and trying to lead from the front in that effort taking on more of a leadership role Bo Bichette the shortstop. Well Ben we know what a good player Bo has been throughout the early part of his career but now he's taken on a little different role. He's a leader. He asked John Snyder if he could speak to the team at the start of spring training and one of his messages was we have to be better including me Bo Bichette. I've got to be better at my job and we all have to be better as a team. Bo told me yesterday he said I think we're good enough to win. Now I want to really find out if we can win. And you know what? You choose to be a leader, you've got to lead every day. I think we are all interested to find out if this can, team can win at the rate that they think they can. They thought they'd have Ricky Tiedemann starting today in this opening game of spring training. But for more information on why that's not the case, here's Hazel May. Ben, well, the top, uh, the club's top prospect was scheduled to make the start today, but an MRI revealed some inflammation between his left hamstring and calf, which overall is good news, but he is still day to day. And that means right hander Chad Dallas will now make the start. Dallas was supposed to follow Tiedemann this afternoon. Dallas was a top under the radar prospect last season. Pitching coach Pete Walker telling me what caught his attention was Dallas's maturity. He's aware of what he can do on the mound, he told me. He's very confident, of course, still developing, but has an overall good feel for pitching. We're looking forward to checking out Dallas's five pitch mix this afternoon. Then Certainly, Hazel, and we're also looking forward to checking out Justin Turner, a member of the New Look 2024 Blue Jays. They kick off Grapefruit League action against the Phillies next on SportsCenter.
Sportsnet Plus. Welcome back to sunny Dunedin, Florida. Ben Schulman and Buck Martinez ahead of the Phillies and the Blue Jays in the Grapefruit League opener for Toronto here at TD Ballpark. Appreciate you joining us today. Both teams just got announced. The Blue Jays about to head out on the field. And the excitement, Buck, you can kind of feel it in the air around here. TD Ballpark is packed, and people can't wait to see this Blue Jays team again. Yeah, this is a special time of the spring, Ben, obviously. The players are anxious. The fans are anxious. The weather is spectacular. You know, the last week or so, we've had a couple of rainy days. It's been a little cooler than normal. I know it's not Toronto cool. But it's a beautiful day and the anticipation is terrific. You can see all Hawaiian shirts. That was part of a giveaway today at TD Ballpark. And you know what? There is so much to be optimistic about with this team. You know, they didn't have a lot of major changes, but the players they brought in are pros. They're baseball players, and that's going to complement this team very well. Yeah, and they feel that they can get a lot of internal improvement out of this team. Where do you look for spots where maybe they could be better than they were last year? More abstractly, not specific guys. Well, I think it's the approach as we talked about in the open. You know, you got to find a way how to score runs against the top pitchers, and that's what you're going to face. Down the stretch, into the postseason, you're going to face the best. So you have to figure out how you beat Luis Castillo in the regular season. How do you beat Garrett Cole in the regular season? And you do that by execution, execution on offense. Blue Jays first have to try and beat the Philadelphia Phillies here today. And here's the lineup for the Phillies, headed up by a familiar face. Whit Merrifield is back, and he is with the Phillies here. Signed a one-year deal in the offseason. Johan Rojas and Mundo Sosa also figure in to be a guys on the 26-man roster for the Phillies coming out of this season. But on the mound, trying to shut those guys down, a guy that you're pretty excited about, Buck, Chad Dallas. Yeah, I sure am. And as Hazel mentioned in the open, Dallas isn't one of those guys that you hear uh, when he signs, okay, they got this top prospect. You can see his numbers between Vancouver and New Hampshire last year. He made 23 starts. And the biggest thing that I like, he throws strikes. Only 48 walks against 144 strikeouts. He's uh, just 23 years old. He began his career pitching in junior college baseball in Texas and then went to University of Tennessee for two years. And he was their weekend starter. He's been a winner throughout where he has played. He's not overpowering. He's not big in stature, but he knows how to pitch, and he's very, very heady. He understands exactly what he needs to do to be successful. Well, the Blue Jays, they were terrific on defense a year ago. They were the Gold Glove team in the American League kitchen, and we're going to see the starting lineup today. Isaiah Kainafalefa comes over from the Yankees. He's going to get a good shot to play at third base. Bichette and Espinal up the middle. Spencer Horwitz, we saw a little bit of him last year. He's at first base. In the outfield, the speedy Cam Eden. He was in spring training a year ago. Varsho, of course, the left fielder playing center today. And Nathan Lucas, he got a chance to play last year with Danny Jansen behind the plate. Baseball is finally back with a first pitch there from Chad Dallas. We are underway. He delivers a strike there to Whit Merrifield at 109 local. Dallas misses a little bit low. Hazel had talked about it in the open. Dallas has some velocity on his fastball, but he has a great mix of breaking and off-speed pitches he'll go to as well. Yeah, he might have the best curveball in camp. He's right there with Bowden Francis in that category. Breaking ball grounded to third. Here's Kiner Falefa, and that's the first look at the Gold Glover at third base in 2020 for the Texas Rangers. Yeah, Isaiah Kiner Falefa is the kind of guy that you think about as a utility player, but he's going to get a good shot at playing third base every day. And he comes from the Yankees. He didn't get a chance to play as much as he's used to. Came up with Texas. He did some catching in the past. He's played a little bit in the outfield. His favorite position, he says, I'm an athlete. I just try to stay athletic no matter where I'm at. Here's the great center fielder defensively, Johan Rojas. And ICAF has talked about that he feels more comfortable when he's moving around. He was the everyday shortstop for the Yankees in 2022, and he said that it was uncomfortable for him to be in a spot where he wasn't getting to play from a couple different looks. Yeah, I think he's at the point of his career. This is Isaiah kind of falafa that's going to be playing a lot of third base. He's not going to play shortstop. He's not going to play a lot in the outfield. So take your ABs at third base. Rojas takes a strike there, and Dallas is ahead here, one and two. 
Uh, Pete Walker likes what he has seen from a lot of these young pitchers all throughout the early parts of the spring. Tried to get Rojas to chase the breaking ball. That's the curveball. He has a good curveball. It comes out of his hand on the very same plane as his fastball. He'll throw five different pitches, and Pete Walker has been impressed with his maturity, the fact that he moves right in here and feels like he's part of this team. Dallas delivers and gets the swing and a miss off of Rojas. First strikeout of the spring, and there are two quick out here, quick outs here for the right-hander. Yeah, he's got a curveball and a slider. It looks like the slider is the pitch that he strikes him out with, and Giano sets up on the outside part of the plate. A good tight spinning breaking ball gets him the first strikeout. So with two outs and the base is empty, Edmundo Sosa playing shortstop today, played a lot of third for Philly last year. Takes a called strike, and Dallas is ahead again, going back to a breaking ball. It's a great way to pitch. Throw strike one. First pitch strikes to all three hitters so far. Here's a 0-1. Swing and a miss. Dialed up the fastball there. And it's 0-2. He's looking for back-to-back -back strikeouts here to end the first. Fourth rounder in 2021 out of Tennessee. Fires home. Swing and a miss. Strike three. And Dallas strikes out a pair to end a 1-2-3. Top of the first inning. The Blue Jays hit for the first time in 20. Back at TD Ballpark, bottom of the first inning, and the Blue Jays have two new signings in the lineup from the Red Sox, Justin Turner, and from the Yankees, Isaiah Kiner Falefa. They will hit third and sixth today against the Phillies, and assisting them as they go back and forth to the plate is Tim Meza, who is uh, right now serving a fantasy football punishment. He's the bad boy for the first couple innings of this game, and he's donning his brutal 4 and 10 record on his back. Yeah. Getting some instruction from the veteran bat boy, but Jimmy <laughs> Mesa, he's taking a little bit of grief from his teammates. He was four and ten in the fantasy league, and I don't know why in the world you would pick a team without a lot of Chiefs on it. I, I don't know either. Although the word on the street is that Tyree Kill was his first round pick, led the league in receiving yards and touchdowns. So he must he must have really gone off track after that one. Yep, he's uh, serving his penance for sure. That's pretty awesome. And it gives you an idea about the chemistry and the makeup of this team and just how close they are together. In the course of the spring, over the course of the spring, we'll talk about that. It's a pretty special group of guys. Leading off for the Blue Jays, 29 year old veteran of four major league seasons, Santiago Espinal playing second base today. Colby Allard fires home, and Espinal chops it to third, scooped up by Rodolfo Castro, and the former Pirate flips it over to first. One down. And there's Tim. <laughs> four and ten, Mesa. He's going to be four ten for the rest of the season. <laughs> it's good motivation, though. You you know you got to get in the got get in the lab and uh and get a better team going next year if you don't want to be the bat boy. First pitch to Bo Bichette. Outside ball one. Bichette with an interesting season last year. Started on an absolute tear and really carried it until he had to go to the IL a couple of times. He takes a strike. 
Uh, how do you assess his year overall? Uh, I think it was a good year. Obviously, he was going to lead the league in hits for a third straight year until he got hurt late in the season, but he finished up fourth in the league in batting. Ground ball up the middle base hit. Bo can hit. There's no question about that. Now the process is, how do you become more valuable as a hitter? What do you do to help your team win more? Bo can hit just about any pitch to any direction of the ballpark. He's got such great coverage, and he can get to the barrel of the baseball in so many different areas. But now his challenge is, okay, how do I become Corey Seager? How do I become Trey Turner? How do I become Xander Bogarts? Those guys that drive in big runs, and he's destined to do that. Speaking of a guy who drives in big runs, 96 runs batted in last year. Justin Turner taking his first A.B. in Blue Jays blue. 39 years old now, and Turner had his best production last year playing for the Red Sox. Takes down and away, and he's not going to give away any plate appearances or at-bats easily. No, he's sure not. And he's going to end up hitting fourth in this lineup during the regular season, and I think that's a big move because your four hitter has always been the RBI guy, and I think that's what Turner is. He understands how to hit with runners on base. He understands how to hit with two outs, and he understands how to hit to the scoreboard. Where are we in the game? Where are we in the lineup? Who's pitching against us? What does my at bat mean as far as winning games? And he'll take a four pitch walk. That one close at the knees. Turner pushes Bichette up to second with the base on balls. And a guy who produced a lot of runs when he was in the lineup last year, Danny Jansen, takes his first at bat. Yeah, Danny has gotten to the point where he understands who he is as a hitter. And, you know, there for a while he was trying to be an average hitter. He was trying to be a guy to hit the ball to right field. Now he says, I understand who I am. I just want to be the best version of Danny Jansen I can be. And part of that is staying on the field. Blue Jays have something going here in the bottom of the first. Jansen takes inside ball one. Tough start here for Colby Allard, who a couple years ago was a very high selection by the Braves, has battled some injuries, and is here in his first year on a one-year deal with the Phillies. 1-0 inside again, and Jansen protecting those hands. He was on the I.L. last year off a foul tip. Yeah, you see, Danny, where's that? Pat on his hand. Nate Pearson is going to get some work here today. It's a big spring for Nate. Theoretically, when you look at their makeup of the team's pitching staff, there's probably only one spot of him. Yeah. And there's a whole lot of talent to battle for that final spot in the bullpen. Well, four. Eight straight balls here, and the Blue Jays have the bases loaded for Dalton Varsho. You know what's really interesting, Ben? What? Here we are in the first inning of the first game, and everybody wants to hit. Everybody wants to do some damage, and we get back-to-back -back walks here in the first inning. That's a pretty good sign early on. You see that as a sign of, of being a little bit more professional, not trying to force things? Absolutely. If it's not there, pass the baton. Here's the 27-year-old Dalton Varsho, who rips the ball to first. It's off the glove of Clemens and into right field. Bichette will score. Coming in home is Turner, and Dalton Varsho strides into second with a two-run double. When you step to the plate after a pitcher has walked two batters ahead of you, you better be ready for that first pitch strike because he's bound and determined to throw you a first pitch strike, and Varsho was all over it. He hooks it on a hot shot off the glove of the first baseman, Cody Clemens, and it skips into right field and cashes in two runs. Walks are big. Yes. Two walks right before that double. Bichette with a single before that. He and Turner scored. Jansen on third and Varsho on second. Here's Isaiah Kiner Falefa, who you mentioned earlier when it was the top half of the first, could get a lot of at bats at third base this year. Well, and here's a situation that the Blue Jays were in so often last year and they couldn't produce. Second and third, less than two outs. Early in the game, you've got to score these runs. And I don't care if it is the first day of spring training. This is where you build that foundation, where you kind of develop your personality in spring training and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. And it's interesting for John Snyder to have 
Isaiah Kainer-Falefa at the plate now. He comes over from the Yankees, and when he talked contract with the Blue Jays, he said, I want to come to Toronto. So here he is. I have talked about seeing the Blue Jays over the last couple seasons with the Yankees, all the talent that they had in that lineup. And he gets to play probably a bigger role here than he did with New York. As he's ahead in the count now, three and one. Well, and, and what he's going to do, he understands his role on his team is not to be a big guy, an RBI guy, but to have good at bats and cash in that guy from third base. 3-1, and he fouls it back into the screen. Been a tough out so far. Well, you can see his approach was hit the ball to the opposite field. I mean, all you got to do, you become a much better hitter when that base runner is only 90 feet away. All you got to do is get it to the outfield. And he spoils another. You know, you have a tendency to overlook utility players on the other teams until you get a chance to see them and talk to them every single day. And then you learn just what kind of ball player he is. Payoff again, and Connor Falefa waves and misses at an elevated fastball. Yeah, he chased one off the plate right there. And he'll be talking to himself a little bit after that, but first out of the spring, not a big deal. For Colby Allard, it's a much needed relief. He had allowed four straight Blue Jays to reach, including the two run double by Dalton Varsho. Now the pitch to Spencer Horwitz what? called strike one. Horwitz is an interesting guy this year because, you know, a, a lot of people see them signing Justin Turner as a replacement for Brandon Belt, but Turner hits right. The Blue Jays maybe could look at Horwitz as an option to be a left handed bat off the bench. Man, he got to taste the big leagues last year. Ball scoots away on the swing and miss, and Jansen's going to come home. It's 3 0 Blue Jays. Yeah, that was really interesting. Garcia, the catcher, just had a clank off his glove on a swing and miss. Generally, you see a ball go off the catcher's bit on a swing if expected to be a foul tip, but that's not the case. He just whiffs on this one. And he wasn't sure where the ball was, and Jan was able to trot home. They rule that one a pass ball, but Horowitz, like you mentioned, did have that little taste, played 15 games in spring training, hit his first major league homer in, in Colorado, and is a guy who got on base a ton in the minor leagues. The one two pitch. Swing and a miss. Strike three. Allard strikes out a pair to end the inning, but the Blue Jays are up three to nothing after their first spring training inning, and Dalton Varsho drove in a pair with a double down the right field line. Back in a moment on SportsCenter.
Welcome back to Dunedin. Nate Pearson enters the game in the top of the second with the Blue Jays leading 3-0. Dalton Varsho doubled in a pair, but before that, a very impressive top of the first inning from Chad Dallas, the right-hander who joins us now on headset following that very, very strong top of the first inning. Chad Ben Schulman and Buck Martinez with you. Congrats on the strong inning. How did you feel out there in your first action? Thank you for one, and uh, it was good. I felt really good. Felt, uh, you know, the nerves were there in the bullpen, and then, you know, once you cross over onto the field, you just got to remind yourself it's the same game. So uh, felt good, though, you know, trying to just fill up the zone. <laughs> just trying to fill up the zone and uh, uh, see what happened. Filling up the zone is always a good approach, Chad, and uh, I know you've been uh, in your first camp, but what's it mean for a young pitcher like you to be around this veteran staff and, and watch their work, and, and what can you gain out of that on a daily basis? Yeah, it's been really cool. Um, like you said, a lot of veteran guys out here, and for one, just getting to you know uh, get to watch them for the most part, and then get to have the conversations with them about certain different you know different things, whether it's uh, you know when they use certain pitches, how they attack hitters. Uh, it's it's been really really fun and. You know, they're awesome guys, so uh, the opportunity to be here with them and kind of talk shop with them has been awesome. Chad, one and seven your first year at Vancouver, your first professional season, then you go back to Vancouver to start the season. What was different for you in your second year compared to your rookie season as a pro? Yeah, I think my first year um, just gave the hitters too much credit. You know, scared to probably a little bit of being scared of getting barreled up. Uh, you know, that's never the plan, but um, you got to fill up the zone. Strikes win games, walks don't. So uh, I think I just given them too much credit, not giving myself enough credit. Uh, so, you know, just a little self evaluation and um, tell yourself, you know, just get out there, fill up the zone. You got a lot of guys behind you who can make good plays. Chad, you have two breaking balls that you mix in pretty often. How do those play off of each other, you think, to make it difficult to hit you? Uh, you know the the curveball the it's more of a straighter down pitch uh, and then sliders I guess the new term a uh, little bit more of a sweeper um, I've always thrown a curveball and then in, in college I added the slider uh, but you know it's just a different look you know you have another you add another pitch into a hitter's mind they have to cover both of them so uh, uh, I like to use both to both sides of the plate and uh, definitely probably a little more slider heavy uh, but the curveball when it's on especially is, is really a fun uh, fun pitch to use. Chad, athleticism runs deep in your family. Your brother happens to be in the Philly system right now as a relief pitcher. He was a great high school quarterback, went to Lamar as a quarterback and a baseball player. Talk a little bit about the impact he's had on your career. Yeah, man, it's uh, having a big brother is one of the coolest things uh, that I get to say that I've done uh, being the little brother, especially to him. Um, he's He's pushed me harder in every, you know, any sport we've ever played or any competition that we made up between ourselves. Um, you know, him and my dad, they just, they've always pushed me and getting to see uh, my brother, you know, live out his dreams is, is just so awesome. And hopefully one day we'll get to play each other in professional baseball. And, um, but as of right now, like I love getting to watch him either whether it's live stream or in, in spring training, uh, getting to see him face some of my buddies. Yeah, that must be a, an amazing experience. As you start this spring training, you obviously have a, a very good start here with your one inning and two strikeouts. What, what are your major goals uh, over this period before you get ready for your season? Yeah, I think a, a lot of it is just reaching the goals, um, you know, the goals of spring training, you know, fill up the zone, uh, see where we can get with Velo. You always want to, you know, Velo is not everything, but uh, if you can add on to it and it doesn't change how you pitch, then you might as well go and get it. So, uh, you know, just getting stronger, getting ready for the season, and um, the. Uh, sorry, I can't hear. Hold on. Oh, yeah, home run there by Weston Wilson has made this a one-run game as he takes Pearson over the left field line. Uh, but yeah, just you know, absorb as much information from the veterans uh, on this uh, on this roster, whether it's position players or pitchers. I mean, these guys hit for a living, and you know, they 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 know pitchers, so uh, you know dipping into their side and trying to figure out what they see what they you know what they think about when they're at the plate and then from the veteran pitchers just how they attack how they keep their composure just watching them be professionals is, is really cool. Yesterday in the locker room after it was announced that Ricky Tiedemann wasn't going to start I saw John Snyder walk past you and I guess he said hey you ready to start tomorrow. What was that exchange like. 
It was good. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I assumed that that was a possibility, um, but you know, you never, you never know. So uh, it was really cool, and you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's nice thinking that they have that uh, that confidence in me to come out here and just start the spring training uh, month of games. So um, that was really cool. Well, I think their confidence was proven right, Chad. Uh, congrats on that strong inning, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, of course. That's Chad Dallas, the right-hander, who had a scoreless inning with a pair of strikeouts today. And, Buck, we've talked about it a little bit in the, in the days coming up. I mean, he, he could easily start this year at Buffalo and be one of those depth guys that the Blue Jays could rely on should they need to go a little bit down their depth chart. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it has to do. He came out of a big SEC baseball program at Tennessee, and he pitched in big games and big atmosphere in the past, and he's going to develop quickly. And you can hear by his conversation how confident he is, and he understands who he is. I loved his statement, strikes win games, and that's what a pitching coach wants to hear all about. Fill it up, give your team a chance to help you out, and when you're that efficient over the course of an inning, it's going to be good. You're going to get your team back on offense, you're going to keep the defense on their toes, and strikes, uh, it's something everybody on the team loves to see. Nate Pearson there showing off the new splitter it looked like to get the strikeout and Pearson is an interesting guy for the Blue Jays bullpen which might have an opening or two as he records his first time. Now you can see the grip on the split finger pitch and that has been a theme around camp. Everybody's throwing a splitter. Everybody's trying to throw a splitter. Not everybody can master it of course. But because of the success of Kevin Gosman and Eric Swanson everybody is thinking if I need something else to complement my arsenal I'm going to try the splitter. And Pearson's doing it. Bowden Francis is doing it. Mitch White's trying it. There's a few other guys that are trying to mix it into their arsenal to help them be more effective. Fastball hit high to center field. Racing back. Barsho looking up. And that ball is gone. Scott Kingery takes it out of the yard. And a pair of home runs for the Phillies have knotted this game up at three. Well, the fighting Phillies, they're a good team, and they've got some good depth in their minor league system as well. And, of course, we, we don't see the A team here today, first game of the spring. But they can score a lot of runs, and when you see your big league team hitting home runs and scoring runs led by Schwarber and Harper and Bohm and all those guys, you want to get into the mix. Scott Kingery is an interesting guy. Of course, he signed that lucrative contract before he ever played a day in the big leagues, and it didn't really pan out for the Phillies. But he's still in the organization. He still has hopes of helping his team. Yeah, he signed a six-year deal ahead of 2018. Hit 19 home runs in 2019, but hasn't played a ton since. Here's Rodolfo Castro, who the Phillies acquired from Pittsburgh in a trade at the deadline last year, although he spent much of his Phillies time at Triple A too. Pearson about to throw his 20th pitch of the inning. And misses outside. He had a walk to start off this inning and, and when you think to you know his season last year he started off really strong and then the walk numbers ticked up a little bit and that was when teams started to get to him a little bit more in the second half. Yeah when you pitch behind you allow the hitters to eliminate certain pitches and you just don't have the ability to mix your pitches in and pitch effectively and that's always been kind of a plague for Nate. Nate's got great stuff. There's no question about that. But you know, you have to execute pitching. It's a lot more than velocity. Movements involved, location is involved, the ability to change speeds, and you know, Nate just hasn't been able to master that just yet. But that split might be something that will help him develop a little further. Here's Aramis Garcia, the catcher. And the first one's roped through the five six hole into left field. For Pearson, another interesting facet, uh, because you know he throws so hard, and people then expect there to be a ton of swing and miss. But he was talking to Keegan Matheson in an MLB.com article on February 20th, and said that he didn't really notice last year, but that he was tipping his pitches a lot, and that he felt uh, that his glove position was giving up which pitches he was throwing, and therefore guys were a little bit more on top of his two-pitch mix than they probably should have been given the velocity and movement. Yeah, when you tip pitches, and nowadays there are guys assigned by their teams to do just that. That's their whole role on the team. You are sitting here looking at video trying to determine if a pitcher comes set in a different spot on a particular pitch. 
It's been in the game forever. And, you know, I had some great coaches over the years that could pick it up just by watching a pitcher on the mound. Nowadays, they assign guys sit in a room, look at video for hours upon hours, seeing if you can come up with something that's different on a particular pitch. Two former teammates facing off as Pearson delivers outside to Whit Merrifield. And especially when you throw two pitches, that's got to be a huge disadvantage when they know, you know, this glove position equals fastball. Yeah, anytime you can eliminate a pitch, it makes you that much better as a hitter. <laughs> Whit Merrifield grounded out to third back in the first inning. Excited to join the Phillies for his quotes so far really uh, thinks that they're a contending team that he can be a big part of and he sprays the ball to right field that's down into the gap cut off by Varsho rounding second headed to third Garcia but a strong relay back in will keep Merrifield at first first and third now with two outs. Uh, that's the way Merrifield hit for the Blue Jays a year ago and second half of the season he was terrific with the ability to put the bat on the ball he goes the other way chases the runner from first to third and that's going to be the end of the afternoon for Nate Pearson gives up a couple of home runs of four hits overall mixing a strikeout but that's an unfortunate start to his spring. Pearson not having a ton of command so far but the Blue Jays will try and keep it tied in the top of the second. A tough start to the spring for right-hander Nate Pearson allows three runs on a pair of homers and two other singles with two outs as well. So he will be replaced here in the top of the second by Abdiel Mendoza. Uh -huh. Ben Schulman and Buck Martinez at TD Ballpark. And Buck, what do you think this means for Pearson? It is just his first appearance of spring, but he is also in a competition for that final spot in the bullpen. Yeah, no, no question he's in competition. He knows that, but it's uh, first spring, and yeah, it's spring training. You, you face batters, you have no idea who they are, and you're just trying to get the kinks out and knock off the rust of a long winter. But yeah, he'll bounce back. But it's all about locating your pitches. I don't care how hard you throw, you got to locate and change speeds. Mendoza locates for the first time here in the top of the second 25 year old from Panama Blue Jays are his third organization has spent time with Oakland and Texas as well. And Blue Jays got him in a triple A rule five. Ground ball goes right by him and they can't make the out at second Espinal looked like he was in between stepping on second for the force and throwing over to first and that will force in another run. Yeah, that's a tough play because the baseball is getting right near the bag and Espinal is coming toward the bag and watch where he tries to feel that as the ball bounces over the mound and then bounces right near the corner of the bag and I'm sure that was a bit of a distraction but if you ask him he'll tell you he should have made the play. It scored an infield single. So an RBI there for Johan Rojas and Edmundo Sosa the ninth batter to come up in this inning for the Phillies. 
And speaking of competition, Santiago Espinal might be in a bit of a competition himself. There are a ton of Blue Jays right now in camp who play a mix of second third or second short third like Espinal has for the last four years. Mendoza gets another ground ball, this time to Bichette. His first defensive play of the spring is right on the money to end the inning. The Phillies strike back with four runs, though, including Weston Wilson and Scott Kingery home runs to take the lead. Welcome back to TD Ballpark. If you missed it earlier, Ricky Tiedemann, who was supposed to start today's ball game, is dealing with um, inflammation in his left leg. Now, his MRI revealed no structural damage, so that's good news. Manager John Schneider told me that the best case scenario for his young left hander is that he will start throwing in the next couple of days. Now, there is still plenty of time <laughs> for Tiedemann uh, to get back on track in his throwing program. It really depends on how good he is feeling, guys. Tiedemann has had some cramping sensation over the years whenever he's been on the mound. Schneider said Tiedemann, uh, Tiedemann uh, he gives him credit for really coming to the coaching staff and letting him know he wasn't feeling that great. He was afraid he might try to power through it because he was excited about today's start. Guys. Thank you, Hazel. Ben Schulman and Buck Martinez here. And Buck, I I'm sure a major league dugout is an incredibly fun place, but this is one of the few times I'm happy we're up here and Hazel is down there as sunflower seeds were just raining all over <laughs> during the last minute. Yeah, you got to keep Vladdy business. You, you got to keep Vladdy busy. You got to keep him on the field and let him play. <laughs> Nathan Lucas sends one to right field. David Dahl, the former Rocky, caught that one. And here's what Hazel was having to deal with. She's just trying to do her job, Vladdy. And, and Vladdy is there. He's not playing. He's not DHing. And this is what the coaching staff has to put up with when he's got a day off. Buck, I actually thought I was in the clear when his name wasn't in the starting lineup. <laughs> but he's here. But he's here in the flesh. <laughs> and that means danger for Hazel May. First pitch is taken by Cam Eden. One out here in the bottom of the second inning. And. Maybe we'll see Vladdy pretty soon. He, uh, uh, of course, is one of the headlines of camp. Eden down, or pardon me, one ball, one strike count evens up right now. Vladdy looking very good, and he's saying he's feeling like he did in 2021. Yeah, and that's a good thing. Obviously, he put up great numbers in 2021 and had a terrific MVP caliber season. And I think one thing that I've had a lot of fans ask me, what's Vladdy's attitude after the club took him to arbitration? I said, Vladdy's attitude is always the same. He wants to play baseball. That's all he cares about. Arbitration's behind him. He's got no ill feelings about the process, and he is in great shape, working hard as he always does. And, you know, I expect big things from Vladdy as he expects big things from himself as well. Vladdy was actually there in person at his arbitration hearing, but... The, the general speculation, the Blue Jays would not insult one of their players right to their face, especially not a player the caliber of Vladimir Guerrero Jr., who they, who's a, been a franchise guy for them. Yeah, I don't think that's the case. It's business. I think they're going to try to win the case, and they'll say whatever they feel like will help them win the case. I mean, that happened with Bo Bichette a couple of years ago, and the Phillies were a little bit concerned about Alec Bohm, their fine young third baseman. He was going through the arbitration process as well. And before his case was heard, Rob Thompson called him up, called him up and said, listen, 
We love you. You're our third baseman. We know you're going to be our third baseman. Don't take the arbitration process personally because it's business, and I think Vladdy understands that as well. Here's the top of the order for the Blue Jays, Santiago Espinal. Called strike one. Espinal grounded out to third base back in the first inning. Colby Allard in his second inning of work misses high, and it's ball and a strike. You know, man, you brought up a great point about Espinal being in competition to make this team. I, I think he knows as he looks around, and, and you can see Zach Pop loosening up. He's going to get an inning here today. But Espy knows what the reality is. He's got to compete. Espinal grounds out to second this time, and although the Blue Jays didn't get the bats going in the bottom of the second, that doesn't mean that they didn't have any fun. Vladdy was having a ball with Hazel May earlier, and we'll continue our coverage coming up next on Sports. The 2024 promotions and events schedule has arrived. Thanks to the help of local Toronto artist Casa Bianca Art, the Blue Jays are on day one of the reveal. Starting off strong, the first category is bobbleheads. Visit bluejays.com slash promotions to learn more. Ben Schulman and Buck Martinez here at TD Ballpark. New pitcher for the Blue Jays as we get set for the third. The Canadian Zach Pop is in the game and his first pitch is hit hard to right field by Cody Clemens back at the wall a leap and it's over the head of Lucas off the wall Clemens will stride into second with a first pitch double. Now Cody Clemens he chews in competition to make that Phillies roster a backup position played a lot of first base last year got into 39 games at first base and of course Cody Clemens everybody knows that. That's Roger Clemens' son, and he's had a chance with the Tigers. I still got some time with the Phillies, and he's trying to make an impression in this camp as well. It was last January that the Phillies acquired Clemens. Pop misses low here to Weston Wilson, who homered in the second. That was in a trade that sent Nick Maton, Matt Vierling the other way, among some others. Pops 1 0. Good block there by Danny Jansen, who wants to stay healthier this year, but that doesn't mean he's going to give up some of the grueling stuff that he has to do behind the plate that makes him so valuable to this team. Well, Danny Jansen and Alejandro Kirk combined, they're the best at blocking balls in the dirt in all of baseball. They just do a great job, and Danny's worked hard. Early in his career, he had 41 wild pitches his first season, and he has eliminated that for sure. Wilson pops up a 2-0. It's caught at first by Horwitz. And a nice bounce back for Pop, who's one of these guys we were talking about, Nate Pearson, in competition. Zach Pop had a really strong start to the year last year. Then it got hampered a little bit by a hamstring strain, and he never made it back to the majors. 
he's probably in the mix at least in that competition too. No question about it. He's got good stuff and he has to keep the ball down. His goal is to throw his sinker and his slider at the bottom of the zone. Ball lifted to left field, turning away from the sun. Eden makes the catch. Two down. Yeah, and you know what? You, you look at this staff, and this is, to me, this is the deepest the pitching staff has been in a long time. And I'm talking about going back to AAA and back to AA. You're going to see kids throughout this spring that you've not really heard of. But we've watched them throw their side sessions, and there's a lot of really legit arms in this camp that are going to have uh, an impact not only in double A AA and triple A but eventually in the big leagues and you need depth all throughout the minors at the starting pitching role pop hits to the zone against Scott Kingery well you just look around baseball especially even if in this division if you start looking around the division teams are challenged to come up with starting pitching depth they just really are I mean you look at last year the Boston Red Sox went through a couple of weeks where they had just two starters in their rotation. They just didn't have any depth in the minor leagues to call anybody up. But you look at the names. I mean, they got Cutter Crawford and Tanner Houck in their fourth and fifth spot in their rotation, and those aren't household names or guys that you would expect to compete. Where the Blue Jays have four legit impact pitchers: Bassett, Gosman, Barrios, Kikuchi, and you know, if Alec Manoa bounces back. They might have the best pitching staff in baseball. Yeah, that, that is certainly a possibility. They were top three in starter ERA combined last year, and that was with Manoa not really in the picture. That was with the Blue Jays using Trevor Richards at times or just starting four guys at times. Uh, Manoa's in a good spot this spring, too. You, know, you look at guys and you say, well, how's he going to react after having that disappointing season and being optioned to the minor leagues a couple of times? And he's coming to the camp in good shape, first and foremost, but with a terrific attitude. He has worked hard often and worked very diligently to get back and recapture that form. Hot shot to second, picked up by Espinal, and he has all the time he needs to go over to first. Pop gives up the leadoff double, but then records three straight outs to strand the runner, and the Blue Jays look for a run to tie it up when we're back in the bottom of the third. Fans are going to be excited for this one. June 19th, the first 15,000 fans will receive a Beau Bichette bobblehead presented by Entercare. Visit BlueJays.com slash promotions to learn more. Bottom of the third inning at TD Ballpark, Beau Bichette leads off Justin Turner and Danny Jansen behind him. On the mound now for the Phillies, the right-hander Nick Nelson. And Nick Nelson trying to get a spot in their bullpen. He's uh, one of those guys that, uh, you know, again, the Phillies like the Blue Jays. They're in pretty good shape on their overall pitching staff, and it's just going to be a matter of who they think might be a good fit. That one off the handle, but it works for Bo. He's two for two, and he's only seen four pitches. He's been really aggressive so far. 
and making sure that all the equipment is scooped up for Bo and that everything is in order. Tim Meza, the last place finisher in his fantasy football league, is over there and uh, he got the elbow guard for Bo and, and ran it back into the dugout. This is going to stay with him all season long. If you weren't with us earlier, Meza going 4 and 10 in his fantasy league. Bo takes off on the first pitch. Turner taking all the way. It's a ball, and the throw is not in time down to second. Well, we talk about what great shape Bo's in, and, and he worked really hard in the offseason, and he is as trim as I've ever seen him. And watch how he gets the lead. He got such an early lead, he wasn't sure if he should run or not. But he guessed right with the pitcher, and Nelson wasn't aware. But, Bo, you know what? He had five steals last year. I wouldn't be surprised if he steals 15 to 18 this year. He's a guy who's capable of doing it. He swiped 25 backs in 2021 and only got thrown out once at that point. He had 13 stolen bases in 2022. But like you mentioned last year, five steals on eight attempts. Yeah, and that's going to be a big part of the game. We talked about how the profile of this Blue Jays team is quite a bit different. They don't hit as many home runs as they have in the past, and they're going to have to score runs in a different fashion. Turner with a line drive past the leaping Sosa into left center field. Pachette scores, and the Blue Jays have tied it up as Turner and Bo come through again. Well, that's going to be something you're going to say all season long. Turner comes through with an RBI, and that's going to be the end of his day. Two at bats, and his work is done for the day. Take a look at this swing for Turner, and we talk about his ability to knock in runs. He didn't waste any time, and he's got an interesting phrase that he uses all the time. Danny Jansen ropes the ball to the left field corner. That's down in fair territory. Jansen looking for extra bases. The throw to second, not in time. And the Blue Jays have something cooking here with nobody out in the bottom of the third. Well, Danny Jansen, we talk about his getting back to what his strength is, and that's pulling baseball. He was all set for a first pitch, and he beats the throw into second base with a head first slide. He picks up an RBI. So three consecutive hits against Nick Nelson here in the third inning, and the Blue Jays have tied it up at four. Zach Britton, by the way, the pinch runner for Justin Turner. Britton on third, Jansen on second. Varsho with two RBIs today fouls off the first pitch. But I mentioned the Turner phrase that I love, and he uses it all the time. He says, I become a much better hitter the closer the base runner gets to home. <laughs> so at first base, he's thinking double or home run. At second base, he's thinking single, I can score him. At third base, a ground ball or a fly ball will get him in. So he's encouraging his players ahead of him, move up the bases because I'm a much better hitter the closer you get to home. And Turner, throughout his career, has been a really strong hitter with runners in scoring position. He's a really good hitter in general, but his numbers get even better in the situations where he has a chance to drive guys in and, and did it for a long time on playoff teams for the Dodgers year in year out right, man that's just experience uh, you know he's played 13 years and he really became a, a good hitter back in 2014 and then he started to understand what it was to drive in runs driving in runs is a skill and it takes experience to understand you got to slow your heartbeat down the situation is just get a base hit you don't have to do dramatic things and there are times when a ground ball will get you an RBI and a fly ball will do the same Varsha looking for one of those. He loops the ball to right field. That's down for a base hit, falling in front of Dahl. Britton scores. Jansen up to third. And speaking of clutch hitting, Dalton Varsha with three RBIs here in his first game of the spring. Yeah, you know what? This is a much better year for Dalton Varsha. He has played a season with this team. He came over last year, traded for two key players with the Blue Jays. And now he's a part of the team. And he worked hard at the offseason to refine his swing. He felt like he was hitting underneath the ball a little bit too much. But I think he's going to have a big year this year. I think he's much more at ease. He knows he doesn't have to live up to the trade. He just has to be Dalton Varsho. Isaiah Kiner-Falefa puts a charge into the ball. That's down in left center field. 
running Jansen and Varsho headed to third and the Blue Jays are up six to four. There's the first hit in a Blue Jays uniform for IKF who smoked that first pitch. Yeah, and Danny Jansen jumping on the first pitch of their respective at bats and you know this lineup you know IKF talked about the contact ability in this lineup and here's the base running ability on display we saw this all year last year from Dalton Varsha one of the best base runners in baseball but this team in this configuration going to have to put the ball in play play contact they don't have the big bats that they had in 15 and 16 and certainly lost some of that power with Teoscar and Guriel moving on last year so you got to change your profile a little bit still nobody out the Blue Jays with five hits this inning for them singles runner go and throw to second in time and Kiner Falefa is thrown out a good strong throw by the catcher Garcia Got a quick release and a strong arm, and I guess it's going to run. And 14 steals in 19 attempts a year ago. Good tag by Sosa, who got in front of the base and applied the tag before Kiner Falefa could get to second. Pitch was a ball, by the way, and now another ball. So Spencer Horwitz is ahead in the count, two and one. Mentioned Teoscar Hernandez. He actually knocked in the first runs of spring training 2024. The Dodgers and Padres played on Thursday to open up the 2024 spring training season, and Teo hit a ground rule double with the bases loaded in his first look in Dodger Blue. Yeah, probably got overlooked because they scored eight runs in the first half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the game was over in about five minutes. I think it was 14 to 1 or something like that by the end of it. Infield in for the Phillies. The 2 2 is in the dirt, and it's a full count. Bichette, Turner, and Varsho with singles this inning. Same with Kiner Falefa. Jansen with a double. Three runs in for the Blue Jays. Payoff pitch, and Horowitz fights it off. Yeah, another situation presents itself here in the first game of spring training. Horwitz with a runner at third base. The infield's drawn in. You've got to be a tough out. You can't strike out. You can't pop up. Get the ball in the air. Get it to the outfield and pick up that extra run. He won't chase on that pitch in the dirt, so he'll take a walk. And runners on the corners now for Nathan Lucas. were in spring training last season there was a battle going on and it was Nathan Lucas who ended up on top he secured one of the last spots on the roster and was with the Blue Jays up and down throughout the season didn't get a ton of at bats but played a lot for them defensively pinch ran for them and was a valuable part of the team he had 42 at bats last spring he was up near the top of Blue Jay hitters in that regard he had a good spring he's a good hitter He's one of those guys and, and you know he hasn't had an extended opportunity in the big leagues but he can play all three outfield positions. He can steal a base and he's a left handed bat. When you look at the makeup of the Blue Jays he's basically the fourth outfielder. The other guys are infield outfield players that are going to move back and forth but he is truly an outfielder and right now he's the fourth outfielder on this roster. Maybe the, the biggest moment for him last year in the game right before the All-Star break where Danny Jansen hit a game tying home run with two outs against the Tigers. It was Lucas who actually drove in the eventual winning run in the top of the 10th inning against the Tigers. I believe it was a double down the left field line that scored the run and the Blue Jays went on to win that game and, and take some momentum into the break. First pitch nearly hit him. Looking back at the home plate umpire but Lucas is okay. Twenty nine years old spent most of the offseason with his two year old daughter and he sends the ball deep to center field. This is more than deep enough to score Varsho who tags at third and will come home a sacrifice fly for Nathan Lucas in RBI and the Blue Jays are up seven to four. 
But you can see the dugout welcoming back Lucas. Uh, Kim Mazur, the bat boy, picks up the bat, but Lucas gets acknowledged for a good at bat. Varsho scores easily from third, and that's what the Blue Jays are harping on. Tack on runs. You score three in the first, and you just can't sit back. You got to continue to add on runs. And Kiner Falafa came up with a big RBI. Up and down the order, they had good at bats this inning. First pitch outside to Cam Eden, and a look over at first by Aramis Garcia. Another term I kept hearing in the week leading up to these games is playing team offense, which to some might seem odd because, in some ways, baseball is a very individual game, but they want their at bats to roll into each other in a way that helps the team win. That's interesting you say that because baseball is a team game, but the individuals are rewarded. Yes. And that's a hard thing to do because it becomes so easy for you to think about your individual numbers when the only thing that really matters is winning a championship. Pitch fouled off and it's two and one. I think it's more difficult now for players to really understand that because we train them as individuals. Everything is individual work. We see it every day in spring training and then we ask them to play like a team. And they go to market and they get valued they see their own as value as what their individual again a big case of that potentially this offseason with Kevin Kiermeyer who who talked about when he was signed how surprised he was that there wasn't a bigger market for him pop up to third Castro charges in and he'll make the squeeze to end the inning the Blue Jays score four runs on five hits including a Danny Jansen double to take the lead Top of the fourth inning at TD Ballpark and a new pitcher for the Blue Jays. Left-hander Brendan Little is into the game to take on 8-9-1 in the Phillies order. Yeah, you can see Little pitched last year in the Cubs system at AAA Iowa. 50 games and again, interesting guy because he doesn't have big strikeout numbers, but he throws a bowling ball for a pitch, a sinking fastball, a little touch, 96, 97 miles an hour. So a really interesting guy. He throws a fastball and a cutter. A little bit of a slider as well, but he's got good stuff and he's interesting. There's a curveball, but he's thrown as high as 97 in some of his side work here in the spring. So he's kind of an interesting guy. He's a bit of a throwback. He's a big ground ball producer. He forced ground balls on about two thirds of all contact last year at AAA. And that allows him to pitch pretty efficiently. Little a 2017 first rounder by the Cubs from not too far away out of the State College of Florida in Bradenton. Soft contact there on the ground. Yeah, that's going to hurt the hands of Castro. And there's one out. Uh, it's hard to get a bowling ball in the air. And when you throw 96 97 with good sink on it, you can get a lot of ground balls. And that was a weak ground ball. From Little. Terrific start to his outing. 
and, and maybe a little bit of that throwback approach. When he played at State College of Florida, uh, he was under longtime Major League pitcher Don Robinson and, uh, and learned a lot from Robinson over that stretch, as he had said at the time. Robinson was a terrific pitcher, but also a great hitter. One of the best hitting pitchers in all of baseball. Three time silver slugger. Lefty delivers home and misses low. And another lefty, although he's, he's got a different job today, is joining us now. Uh, the, the interim bat boy for the Blue Jays, Tim Meza, is on headset. Tim. You draft Tyree Kill in the first round and go four and ten. What happened? Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say, oh, <laughs> I needed that. Um, a culmination of things. I, I mean, you could tell I'm out of breath. I mean, that, that, <laughs> those duties. I took those duties seriously, and I was I was sprinting all over the field. Um, had a couple injuries and and probably a couple bad uh, managerial moves. Um, however, you know, I'm. As a, as a baseball player, you know, you're, you kind of get analytical, and, and I, I did, I scored the seventh most points in this league, and I go four and ten. I think that just uh, speaks to, to some bad luck on, on my end uh, throughout the course of the, the once again, season. Once again, Tim, it just shows you analytics aren't everything. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, <laughs> the record on the back of my jersey uh, right now kind of speaks, speaks to what happened. Um, but yeah, yeah, but I enjoy it. You know, a lot of the guys enjoy it, and, and we have a blast doing it. Well, one thing we know you finished last. Who won it? Uh, Jansen. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, Dan Jansen. He, he finished first. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw him under the bus a little bit here. You know, he finished last last year and, uh, you know, kind of got away with some stuff. You know, meanwhile, I think I think they saw that I was I was at the bottom of the, the standings and said, all right, let's have some fun with this guy. Um, but I, he, he for sure is enjoying watching me have these duties today. Well, you and Jano going back and forth is nothing new. You are the two longest tenured players in the Blue Jays organization. What is that like now to be you know, kind of the elder statesman of the team? You've been here throughout the growth of this whole group. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's it's pretty remarkable. And, and um, you know, it's 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 great. You know, Jansen and I were, were drafted. Uh, the same season and, and to kind of come up together and and watch each other kind of grow as as players and um, it's it's been it's been great you know and, and kind of that pitcher catcher relationship but, but we definitely take it a, an extra step and you know he's been with me you know through through thick and thin and and the same for for me with him so it's been it's been awesome and and he's he's a great friend uh, and, a, and a really good teammate too Tim, I spent my entire career in the bullpen in the major leagues, and you guys, for me, have one of the strongest bullpens in all of baseball. But beyond the physical skills, talk about the chemistry of your bullpen and how close you guys are down there. Yeah, it's a very tight knit group um, that we have down there, and and you know, with that comes you know the accountability aspect, and we hold each other accountable and. Um, if something needs to be taken care of or something needs to be said, you know, somebody somebody's going to approach you about it, and and obviously in a in a professional professional manner. But no, we we everybody takes their job seriously down there. They take their role seriously. We we know what our roles are, and and it's about going out and getting outs um, whenever you're called upon, and and you've got to be ready every day. And so it's it's a, it's a very tight knit group, but it's a very serious group as well. And and. We, you know, we know when we come into the game that we got to get as many outs as possible and as many as we're called upon. That's a great play. Good execution right there by the first baseman and the pitcher. One more question, you know, uh, uh, about the bullpen and about the pitching staff in general. For me, this pitching staff is terrific. But we talked about Bo meeting with the team before the game and challenging himself and the rest of the team to be great. And I understand some of the pitchers also spoke up. So. What does that mean when you put your feelings out there in the open so everybody knows what the expectations are of this team? Yeah, I, you know, he's he's Bo is Bo is a leader. He's obviously the, the leader of this team and, and his when he speaks, people listen and a couple pitchers spoke up as well. Chris Bassing, Kevin Gosman and, and similar things, you know, when they speak and, and you know, you listen and, and the expectation is set and and it's your job as the player to, to meet those expectations. And, and obviously we're when we step on the field, we're expecting to win and we're expecting to perform well. So you got to take it, take every day as an opportunity to to develop still and, and put your best foot forward. But when you get out there, it's about competing. And for pitchers, it's about getting outs and, and getting as many outs as as um, you know we're called called to do. 
Two strikes on the batter, Johan Rojas, and the pitch is lifted in foul territory, first base side, not too far away from Tim, but it drops. Tim, uh, we really, really enjoyed watching you be a bat boy today, but I think we'll enjoy a little bit more when we see you get to do your day job again coming up soon. Good luck uh, with your next appearance coming up in the spring and appreciate you taking the time. No, thanks. Thanks for having me on. That is Tim Meza with uh, a little bit of help from Alec Manoa. Uh, put some gum on him as well. Here's another pitch from Little, and it misses down low, one and two. Little trying to strand the runner Garcia at third. But Tim Meza, you know, Jordan Romano was great last year. He is a very good closer. Tim Mesa might have been the most important reliever for the Blue Jays for a lot of last season. He stranded a boatload of runners and was the only lefty for a while. Yeah, and you know what? He did a great job, and, you know, he went through Tommy John a couple years ago. He's bounced back. He understands who he is now and knows what he has to do to be effective. But with he and Hennessy's Cabrera in their bullpen. They've got two formidable left-handers to handle anybody that comes up late in the game, and they can flip-flop. One can pitch early, one can pitch late, depending on what the matchups are. And it's a good uh, situation for John Snyder to have those two great lefties in their bullpen. Another pitch fouled off. Good battle here being put on by Rojas. And the two lefties give a little bit of different looks. You know, Meza is is a very much a sinker slider guy. Cabrera dials it up a lot with his fastball. He's also got the pair of breaking balls, so you can kind of use them, I think, in, in different situations. Yeah, they're really different, as you mentioned. And, and, you know, Cabrera might get you a few more strikeouts than Mesa, but Mesa's never going to get himself into trouble. Little with a strikeout there. He gets out of trouble, stranding the one out double by Garcia and keeping the Blue Jays on top as we go to the bottom of the fourth. Fifty two goals and counting for Austin Matthews. Check out the Leafs and Abs tonight on Hockey Night in Canada. 630 Eastern 330 Pacific on Sportsnet and CBC. A lot of games being played here as we get back to baseball. First day of spring training for the Blue Jays leading the Phillies right now after a big first and third inning and leading off this inning top of the order Santiago Espinal. Ben Schulman and Buck Martinez Hazel May down on the field as well and Espinal looking for his first time aboard today. He's 0 for 2 with a pair of ground outs. The 1 1 from Nick Nelson high and tight two balls and a strike. And it was an interesting year last year. For Espinal, a lot of competition at second with Whit Airfield emerging a little bit more last season. Kevin Biggio had a stronger year last year. And there was a game, I want to say, in early June. Espinal had three hits 
and he got injured in that game. Went to the injured list right as some momentum was starting to build. He strikes out looking here, and, and as he came back, Merrifield and Biggio were kind of stepping into their hotter parts of the season. Yeah, that's the challenging part for extra man when you don't have the ability to play on a semi-regular basis, and somebody else steps in, then you always risk the chance of somebody getting hot, and you never get your job back. But he had a good finish to his season, and he's in a good spot right now. He understands it's a competition. Bichette takes outside. Bows two for two today with a pair of singles. He's come around to score on both of those as well and stole a base back in the third. Bichette not chasing against Nelson, 2-0. Oh. Now, here's a chance for him to really zero in and, and narrow down his focus. You've got the count in your favor. You've already got two hits. Now you've got to think about at least getting a pitch you can hit for a double. Doesn't want to swing at that one. It's 3-0. These are the counts where you want to see Bichette do more damage. Yeah, and you know what? He, he understands that yeah, I might be able to hit that pitch, and I might be able to hit a pitch that's off the plate. Big swing and a pop up behind first. Going back, Clemens, and he gets called off. The second baseman is there. That's Whit Merrifield in right field to make the catch. Two outs now, and the Blue Jays have more than just new faces in the lineup. They also have new faces in the coaching staff. Longtime Red Sox third base coach Carlos Fablos is joining the Blue Jays now. Yeah, Fablos has been with the Red Sox since 2007, and he came up to the big leagues. He's a terrific infield coach. He just arrived in camp. He had some visa issues, and today is his first day in uniform with the Blue Jays. But he's a very, very accomplished third base coach and a terrific infield coach. They've also had Fablos to the third base role. Brought back to Marlowe Hale, a former Blue Jay coach, who's now an assistant manager. And I teased him about the role. What, what in the world's assistant manager? He said, well, you know, it's a bench coach, but they've got a new title for me. I think there are three assistant managers in the big leagues, and Marlo Hale's a welcome return to this organization where he was a coach earlier in his career. Of course, he's been associated with Terry Francona for an awful oh, yeah. long time. He and Tito have been together both in Boston and in Cleveland. Yeah, what, whatever you call it, if it's bench coach, associate manager, assistant manager, when DeMarlo Hale is in the dugout for you, it feels like your team gets better. Yeah, and you know, he's in a learning process himself. He says, I want to sit back and learn about these players just by watching them. And he will get his judgments as to what they can do who they are just by watching the spring unfold and he's an interesting guy a very valuable asset to have on his team two down Zach Britton at the plate was a catcher mostly in 2022 transition to outfield last year and he hits it hard but a sliding stop by Clemens at first who gets up from the seat of his pants and steps on the back to end the inning Blue Jays go down one, two, three, and the son of the former Blue Jay, Roger Clemens, Cody Clemens, with a nice backhand stop to end the frame.
A big part of the spring is figuring out who's going to be on the back end of your pitching staff. Who is in the bullpen and for a top bullpen in the majors like the Blue Chase, there are not many spots available. Maybe one up for grabs for a good handful of pitchers. These are just some of the options. There are even more guys if you factor in some of the potential starting depth options as well, like a Mitch White, a Bowden Francis, maybe a Yariel Rodriguez sign from Cuba, so it, it is a loaded bullpen, and that's a great problem to have, Buck. Well, it sure is, and competition gives you better results, there's no question about it. I mean, the bullpen, you know, Romano, Swanson, Garcia, Meza, Chad Green, Henesis Cabrera, Trevor Richards, they're all probably locks to make this team. And uh, you talk about Chad Green, for instance, he's a guy that is further removed from Tommy John, had a good finish to the season last year, and he's only been better so far this year. And here's another interesting name, Zulueta. Yes, sir, Zulueta, the Cuban pitcher that pitched in 45 games last year for Buffalo. And he's got a good arm, and, you know, he's coming back from injury as well, but I think now he's in a pretty good spot to compete. I think in the past we saw him just trying to establish himself, but now he knows that he has to compete, and it's kind of interesting. He and Yariel Rodriguez were teammates a few years ago in an independent league, so they're reunited once again in this battle of relievers for an extra spot on the bullpen. He's Buck Martinez. I'm Ben Schulman. Hazel May down on the field as well. Zulueta starts off against Edmundo Sosa. Yasmer Zulueta started last season in the Buffalo rotation, and there was a thought that maybe he could be a depth piece for the Blue Jays, but like you said, battled some injuries and was a little bit inconsistent out of the rotation. They got much better results out of him when they moved him to the pen, and he gets a foul ball here to make it 2-2. Two and two. Now, being a starting pitcher is very, very difficult. I mean, not only do you have to have good stuff, you have to have the ability to change speeds, throw a secondary pitch over, and probably throw a changeup or a splitter to be effective. And not everybody can do that. And physically, it's demanding. Ground ball pokes softly to short. There's the new shortstop, Leo Jimenez, and his throw goes wide. Jimenez kind of led Horwitz, the first baseman, into the base path. And the word on him is that he is the most talented defensive shortstop in the system, but they're his first play of live action in the spring. Yeah, we've made some wholesale changes on defense, and Menace comes in and throws a tough sinking fastball over to the first baseman. They're going to reward the hitter Sosa with an infield base hit. Tough play, but one that I think Jimenez would say I should have made. Sosa really did burn it over there at least to kind of get to the bag around the time the throw was there. And trying to bounce back now. Zuleta starts off. Cody Clemens with a strike. It's spring training for scorekeepers, too. Oh, yeah. It's spring training for us. <laughs> it's spring training for everyone. Oh. Everyone but the groundskeepers because they got this field in midseason, arguably the stretch run of the season form right now. It is looking beautiful here at TD Ballpark. Yeah, they did a good job a couple years ago when they renovated this field. And it's pristine. It's a beautiful field. Hard ground ball through the right side. A second base hit of the day for Clemens. Rounding second, headed to third, Sosa. And the throw will be cut off by Jimenez. Back to back singles now for the Phillies, who threaten with nobody out in the top of the fifth. Now, once again, we talk about pitchers pitching from behind. It's a very difficult thing to do. You really free up the hitter to be more aggressive. And he can narrow his focus on something he wants to hit. Cody Clemens pulls it through the right side of the infield. So as it goes first to third. But boy, pitching behind is difficult. I don't care who you are, how hard you throw, you got to pitch ahead to be most effective. Here's Weston Wilson, homered in the second and popped up in the third. Wilson played in eight games with Philadelphia last year. Actually, homered for his first base hit in his first game, but it was uh, slightly overshadowed by Michael Lorenzen tossing a no hitter for the Phillies in that game. 1 0 is tagged down the left field line. Fair ball. That'll score at least once. Jogging in home is Sosa, and they're going to give the wave to Clemens as it's still stuck in the corner. Clemens will come in without a throw. It's a two run double for Weston Wilson in a one run ball game. 
another hitter count for a Phillies hitter and Rustin has hit the ball hard a couple times today. He's homer and now he picks up a couple of key hits, a home run and a double. And that ball goes all the way down into the corner. You can see how far Cam Eden was over in the gap, not expecting the ball to be pulled, but it was pulled right down the left field corner. And that's going to end up as an RBI double. So now four RBIs on the day for Wilson, two run homer and two run double. By the way, we mentioned earlier that Leo Jimenez is at short. Arelvis Martinez is at second for the Blue Jays. And a ground ball up the middle. Jimenez with a dive, but it's right past the glove and into center of base hit. David Dahl drives in a run as Wilson comes home. And it's a tie game at seven. That's a familiar theme in spring training, especially right out of the shoot. The hitters having an advantage over the pitchers, and the veteran David Dahl goes right back up the middle. Looking for a first pitch to hit and he bounces it past the infield picks up another RBI. He is one for three. Dahl an all star with the Rockies in 2019. Suoleta hits the zone there against Scott Kingery 0 and 1. Right hander fires home and it's looped over the head of Martinez down in right center field of ace hit trying to go first to third is Dahl and the throw cut off by Martinez. So five straight hits here for the Phillies off of Zuleta. They've been really aggressive too. Five batters have seen a total of 13 Zuluetta pitches. Right. And the last year have been swinging in the first pitch. It's a breaking ball. Got too much in the middle of the plate to back up slider. And that becomes a very good pitch to hit. Kingery's had a good day at the plate. He's got a couple of hits. Hit a home run in the second inning. He's on first now after the single. Dahl's on third, and Rodolfo Castro is up. Castro's played in three major league seasons, only 24 years old. He swings and misses. Zulueta evens up the count. It's a tough start to the inning. An infield single for Edmundo Sosa that could have been a 6 3 put out. Throw went wide to the bag. And Zulueta. Although well, the velocity is looking good, that fastball at 97 has not found an out or, or any weak contact really since. Still the early days of spring, though. The switch hitter Castro looks at another pitch, and it's three and one. Some action for the Blue Jays right now as the pitch count goes up. Grayson Thurman, the right hand. One of the benefits of this new player development center down here in uh, Don Eden is the minor leaguers are right there with the major leaguers and you can bring some minor league pitchers over who aren't in big league camp to provide some depth for situations just like this. It is a sprawling complex to say the least that doesn't even even really begin to describe it. I hadn't seen it until this year and and I think you could get lost in that complex if it was your first time very easily. There's a walk to Castro to load the bases here with nobody out. And it, it's great for the Blue Jays players in the system as well that everyone gets to be so close together. I know talking to Isaiah Kiner Falefa, he did say, you know, Texas, where he was for four years, had a, had a pretty recently renovated facility too, but this was still you know, about as nice, if not the nicest, that he had seen in his time with the Rangers, Yankees, and Blue Jays. First pitch to the nine hitter Aramis Garcia called strike one. Blue Jays still looking for their first out here in the top of the fifth inning. Three runs in for the Phillies. And a foul ball off to the right side. It's 0 and 2.
starting to see some changes come through for both teams now. The Blue Jays with a pair of defensive changes. Jimenez and Martinez up the middle. Swing and a miss. Strike three against Garcia. And Zuoleta finally has that elusive first out. Now we see a change on the Philly side as they'll bring in a pinch hitter. Whit Merrifield's day is done. Eric Brito is into the game, hitting in Merrifield's spot. Brito with a broken bat grounder to short. Jimenez is going to go the safe way to first, and he records the second out of the inning. Yeah, Brito got jammed. Uh, Zuluena got that ball in a good spot. They had a good grounder, but they couldn't turn two, so Jimenez goes across the diamond for the second out of the inning. David Dahl came in to score on the play, so the Phillies take the lead. It's an RBI ground out for Brito. Going to see if Zulueta can finish this inning. Some action in the Blue Jay pen. But two quick outs here. And a first pitch strike to Johan Rojas. 24 pitches thrown now by Zulueta. That's getting close to the end. They don't want him to throw many more pitches than this. Swing and a miss. 0 and 2. Yeah, I'd be surprised if he faced another batter. Action for the Phillies as well. Could see Dylan Covey next yeah. inning. The 0 2. Outside, yanked the fastball. Johan Rojas at the plate figures to factor into the Phillies' future. Played 60 games with Philadelphia in center field last year and was one of the better defensive center fielders in baseball in that time. He hits the ball hard to straightaway center. Varsho back at the wall. And it squirts out of his glove as he makes contact with the blue wall. Two runs into score, and Rojas at third with a triple. Couldn't tell for a moment in the shadows there if Varsho was able to secure it. But it looked like it just got squeezed out right as he hit the fence. Yeah, I think if Dalton Varsha had a chance to do this over, he might have turned and gone with the ball a little bit more. He tried to drift back on it and never got back in position to really make a catch. It's beyond his reach up against the wall. And Zulueta, as we mentioned, not going to throw many more pitches. A tough outing for he as well. And I'm sure Dalton Varsha would like another shot at that ball, one that he might have been able to make a catch on. As Grayson Thurman continues to warm up there, Aurelvis Martinez at second base. And double-A manager Cesar Martin told me that the focus for Martinez is playing a strong second base, particularly turning double plays. And infield coordinator Danny Solano told me that people think that playing second base is easier than the left side. He said, when you're on the left side of the field, the ball is in front of you, particularly on double plays, guys. The ball tends to be behind you. We have a right-handed hitter at the plate 
the speed and the angle of that baseball is, is different. So that's the challenge for Aralvis Martinez here at spring. So far, so good. His reaction time is great, Solano said. His footwork is fantastic, according to Martin. Guys? Hey, so he was a guy who played a, a lot of short, played some third, but he does seem like it's full steam ahead now with Aurelvis Martinez at second base and Grayson Thurman here on the mound, an undrafted signing by the Blue Jays out of the University of Lynchburg last year. His 1-1 one, one fouled back. What, what do you think about Martinez now at second? They're trying to find a place where he can play because he can swing the bat. Oh, yeah. He came up as a shortstop. He's just 22 years old. He made a nice adjustment in AAA after getting off to a terrible start in AA. But really had a fine season. He's a power hitter. And I think he's got big time power that's legit. I think he's got a chance to be an impact hitter in the big leagues for a long time. And now the question is where will he be most comfortable? And where will he be effective enough to play on defense? And I think right now they're going to stick with him at second base. But he can swing it. Martinez with 28 home runs last year, 30 home runs the year prior. And he played all of 2022 at double A, hit just over 200. He added about 40 points to his batting average in 2023 while splitting his time at double A and triple A. So in theory, against tougher competition, he was able to find more contact and still maintain that power. Yeah, he understands now that you don't have to hit every pitch and he has a tendency to chase a lot, but he's cutting that down and using the whole field. 3-2 is hit hard on the ground to short. Jimenez with the long throw. It's high. And the Blue Jays cannot record the out as a run will come in to score. The former Blue Jay 13th rounder, Trevor Schwecki, gets aboard here. And it is 11 to 7. Yeah, Jimenez, he made a mistake right there by not really getting himself in position to make a throw. Watch how casually he goes after this throw. Right there, a couple of steps, takes too long. And when he does, he sees the runner getting close to first base, rushes the throw, and throws high. So theoretically, he could have two errors defensively in this inning. Wasn't charged with the first one. Uncharacteristic showing here. Jimenez is one of the stronger defensive shortstops the Blue Jays have in the system. And here's a pinch hitter for the Phillies. It's Bryce Ball in the spot of Cody Clemens, who ended the day of two for two with a double, a single, a walk, and two runs scored. All cuts and misses. And it's 0-1. Pardon me, 1-1. One one. Grayson Thurman on the mound. Spent most of last year with single-A Dunedin. Swing and a miss, and it's 1-2. and two. 34 appearances out of the pen. Recorded six saves for the Blue Jays but had a couple appearances at double-A New Hampshire as well when the Fisher Cats needed some pitchers there in the bullpen. Line drive off the end of the bat, six into right field for a base hit, picked up by Lucas, and this Phillies offensive inning continues. They've had 11 batters come to the plate in this inning. They've scored seven runs, and the 12th batter of the inning, two up now. It's going to be Matt Kroon coming into the game, pinch hitting for Weston Wilson as we start to see the full reserve lineup come out for Philadelphia. Yeah, and Bo, he gets a good pitch to hit. Looked like it might have been a changeup that he lines into right field. First pitch strike by Thurman. 25 year old from Lynchburg, Virginia. First and second and two outs. And the 0-1 is off the handle, looping toward right field, and it's a foul ball, barely. It's 0-2. Yeah, the way things have gone for the Phillies, you expect that that might have dropped for a base hit. They have a couple of big innings here. Back in the second, they scored four runs on five hits, and now they've got seven runs here in this extended fifth inning. And they've done this without a home run. Have a triple, a double. But strung together a lot of hits to start the inning. Kroon trying to keep it going. 18th round pick in 2018 out of Oklahoma State. 0-2 fastball is too hot. Two. 
Bruins spend most of last year with double A Reading reached triple A Lehigh Valley for the end of the season. He takes another pitch upstairs. That was big for him in the Phillies given the fact that he tore his ACL two games into the 2022 season at double A Reading and missed the entire campaign. So to stay a little bit on track and get to triple A was big for his development. 2-2 is lifted to right field. Racing back, Lucas looking up, and that ball is gone. Three-run home run, Matt Crude, and the Phillies have scored 10 runs here in the fifth. Welcome to spring training. You here, see a bunch of guys you're not really familiar with. The pitchers are pitching without a whole lot of scouting report information, and they're still refining their command and location. And in this small ballpark, the ball is jumping. That ball is up and away, and Kroon, he's got some pop, and he hits this one over the wall in right field to cash in three runs. Now another big hit for the Phillies. Now it's 14 to 7 on strength of 15 hits for Philadelphia. Kroon, a guy who drove, it, drove in almost 60 runs last year at 50 extra base hits in under 100 games. Dahl hits it on the ground to second. Martinez picks it up and throws to first. And that will end the top of the fifth. Halfway through this one, and the Phillies up a touchdown. It's 14 7 in Bradenton or Dunedin. Seven runs for the Blue Jays in the first four innings and a new beard and a new role for Don Mattingly who is offensive coordinator now in addition to bench coach. He's more in charge of what's going on offensively. Buck, what do you think that can do for this team? Donnie Mattingly loves to talk about hitting and now you can see him chatting with Hunter Mintz, one of the assistant hitting coaches as well. And Matt Haig has also been added to this staff as a hitting coach. But Don Mattingly is going to be challenged with giving the hitters a game plan against a specific specific pitcher each and every game and he's going to tell them hey what do you want to hit against this guy stay with that game plan and try to be more selective don't give away any at bats and I think that's something he did very well as a player and now given that responsibility he's freed up to talk to his hitters during the course of a game after establishing a game plan prior to the game he can remind him hey you don't want to hit that pitch. You want to get something better to hit, and he was going to be an asset on the bench for them. Rodolfo Castro coming up with the grounder, tosses it across the diamond, and there's one down there as Danny Jansen's retired for the first time. Here's Dalton Varsho, who could be a big part of this new look Don Mattingly offense. He's already yeah. driven in three runs there. Yeah, and you know what, Dalton's uh, he's motivated to have a good season, and certainly. Having a game plan and sticking with it is part of it and it's all about you know what Pete Rose has talked about it throughout his entire career the key to hitting is getting a good pitch to hit you don't have to hit them all and you can take some strikes and you can hit with two strikes but the key to having a good career as a hitter getting a good pitch to hit. 
And Don Mattingly says, you know, in particular, specifically, Bo Bichette, he can hit a lot of pitches, and he can hit pitches off the plate for base hits. But you've got to bring the pitcher into a smaller zone in the strike zone to be the best version of yourself. And that's what Donnie's going to challenge his hitters to do this year. Not only there beside Hunter Metz. And the Blue Jays offense has hummed along so far. Or show a big part of that, a double and a single. 2-1 he is upstairs to Dalton, and it's three balls and a strike. Just a, a litany of defensive changes for the Phillies, by the way, with multiple pinch hitters last inning, not to mention Carlos De La Cruz coming in in right field and a ball line to right field that gets down for another Varsho base hit. He's three for three. And Don partly put in this position now because the Blue Jays, after being one of the most formidable offenses in the game over 2021 and 22, fell into the middle of the pack last year. Why do you think that is, or, or what do you think he can do in this situation? Well, a lot of the difference between 22 and 23 was not having to ask Hernandez and Lourdes Curiel. I mean, they were big parts of the offense, and when you take big parts of your offense away, that has an impact on the rest of the hitters in your lineup. But at the same time, they're just not a power hitting team. I mean, there are guys that are capable. Of course, Vladdy's capable of hitting a lot of home runs, so for Springer and, and Bo. But overall, it's not the power laden team we have seen in the past with this ball club. Kiner Falefa with a looper to center. That gets down. The pinch runner, Stuart Baroa, up to second and back to back singles. But you talk about how, to, how you improve. Okay, so maybe we're not going to be that home run hitting ball club, but Kiner Falefa is one of those guys that they're going to expect to put the bat on the ball, and he's rewarded with his second base hit of the afternoon, and his day has come to an end as well. Addison Barger taking over the pinch runner at first. Spencer Horwitz may be taking his last plate appearance of the game two on one out and he hits a ground ball past the first baseman into right field getting the wave is Barroa Barger stopped at second for a moment but he'll advance to third and I think he thinks there might have been some interference potentially moving up to second on the play is Horwitz. Now Horwitz had a strike out and a walk at his first two plate appearances and he hooks one past the first baseman as Barroa comes in to score. He takes a good pass at it and hits it sharply and it goes off the first baseman's glove. He let that ball play him a little bit. That's Bryce Ball down there at first base had that ball go off his glove. And a pinch runner now for Horwitz. Standing on second base right now, De Los Santos takes over for the Blue Jays. Nathan Lucas at the plate. Luis De Los Santos that is at second and a ground ball chopped towards Bryce Ball again. It squirts out of his glove, but he recovers to flip it to first. However, that will be a run driven in by Lucas, his second RBI of the game on a ground out. Well, he had a sack fly back in the third inning and now he gets an RBI on a ground out with that guy at third base. Another thing they're preaching, get that runner in from third. Doesn't always take a base hit to get you an RBI. So after a 10 run top of the fifth by the Phillies, the Blue Jays have scored two here in the bottom of the fifth. Runner on third, Eden swings and misses. He is the ninth hitter from today's starting lineup, and maybe it's his last plate appearance as well. Another pitch low, and the count is even at one and one against the right hander Dylan Covey, who spent a, a good amount of time in the major leagues with the Phillies. Another pitch out of the zone, and now Eden ahead of the count. He was a guy the Blue Jays used late in the season last year. Probably their biggest stolen base and speed threat they have in the system. 53 steals last year. Hard hit ground ball foul. Del Santo said to dance out of the way. And Cam Eden's a very good defender as well. He can really play center field. He's playing in left field today. 
He needs to be more consistent with the back to become a big leaguer. That's Paolo Espino, the veteran former big leaguer that's on this team as a non roster invite. Swing and a miss there by Eden, and that will end the bottom of the fifth. Blue Jays score a pair. Varsho and Kiner Falefa pick up hits and runs and come out of the game. Day one of the Blue Jays promotion launch features bobbleheads. April 12th, the first 15,000 fans receive a Jose Barrios gold glove bobblehead. Visit bluejays.com slash promotions to learn more. Blue Jays and Phillies in the opener of Grapefruit League action here in Florida. And Rob Thompson is here, the manager of the Phillies, a Canadian, a Canadian Baseball Hall of Famer, and as Canadian managers go, about as successful as there's ever been. Yeah, he has done a terrific job with his team. He, of course, came to the Phillies as the bench coach for Joe Girardi, and then when Girardi was let go, he took over. Played college baseball at KU in Kansas and he was a catcher got signed out of there started a coaching career very early in his career spent 28 years with the Yankees in many different roles. I played golf with him on Super Bowl Saturday and we played at Copperhead over at Ennisbrook and he made back to back birdies for the first time Ooh. in his golfing career. And you got a bunch of Canadians that live in Ennisbrook and Rob Thompson from Stratford, of course, uh, former mayor of Stratford, Dan Matheson was in the group and we had a good time and Rob celebrated back to back birdies for the first time as a golfer. I don't even know if I have back to back bogeys in my <laughs> bag. I think one bogey I'd be pretty happy with. But. Yeah, but Rob's done a great job with his team and you know he's now 60 years old and there was a time a couple of years ago before he got the appointment as a manager he was kind of playing stepping away from baseball he'd been doing it a long time but now he's really a fixture with this Philly team and he's done such a terrific job he's a great communicator and he's got a heck of a ball club to manage as well. Phillies made the World Series in 2020, 2022 and then lost game seven of the NLCS to the Diamondbacks last year. Here's Simone Muziati going up against Paulo Espino in the game for the Blue Jays. You had said it before the break, a veteran. That's another guy that maybe provides some depth for Toronto oh. in the starting pitcher front. Espino has pitched for a couple different major league teams, uh, Milwaukee, Texas, most recently the Nationals, where he's pitched both out of the pen and as a starter. Foul ball is that one struck Muziati in the front foot. Espino, a 37 year old from Panama, 10th round pick of Cleveland in 2006. Two, two, called strike three. Espino beats Muziati with an 89 mile per hour fastball, one down. 
Uh, good spot, good location. Obviously, a veteran pitcher. He's 37 years old now. And he was drafted out of the IMG Academy in Bradenton, Florida, not far from here. IMG, one of the top athletic schools in a couple different respects in the U.S. Called strike here to start off his battle against De La Cruz. Carlos De La Cruz, an outfielder. The 0 1. Swing and a miss, 0 and 2. This is De La Cruz's first chance at the plate. Came in defensively for David Dahl a couple innings ago. O2 swing and a miss slowed it down and had De La Cruz way out in front at 73. Yeah, that's the experienced pitcher on the mound and he knows you don't always have to give 100% effort on every pitch and he takes something off and comes up with a very effective slow curveball and had the hitter way out in front so back to back strikeouts for the veteran. Espino pitched in the Dominican Winter League this year as a starter entirely. Had nine starts, almost 50 innings logged, and had an ERA of 2.4. Just outside there, it's one and one. Back to back strikeouts. Here's Kendall Simmons in his first chance, and he fouls it back. It's one and two. Brian Servin behind the plate now for the Blue Jays and it appears like he is in a battle for that third catcher spot kind of that Tyler Heineman role from last year as that pitch lands in the dirt two and two Servin coming over from Colorado. Yeah the Blue Jays have a couple of guys in that situation as uh, Peyton Henry another guy that's got big league experience he's on this roster now. But the Blue Jays aren't going to take three catchers. They're going to take no. two catchers, Danny Jansen on and Kirk. But you make a great point. That third catcher will probably be in AAA, the guy with major league experience, very much like Heineman last year. And if the last two years tell anything, they're going to at least at some point end up using a third catcher as the 3 2 misses. It's a two out walk. Blue Jays have had a couple different guys feature over the last couple years. Because you know the catching position is just so physically demanding that it's likely that at a certain point you might need to call on an extra body. It's the most difficult thing to do in baseball, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt it. You might have some bias, but I don't doubt it. Uh, it's uh, you know, and it's hard to find guys that uh, you know. Basically, the Blue Jays are fortunate they have basically two catchers that are everyday players. They just don't happen to play every day. But uh, yeah, there, there's not many traditional backup catchers around baseball anymore. A guy that will play 40 games maybe and just kind of stay behind because catchers don't catch as much as they once did. You know, Johnny Bench, I heard him on our interview this morning. He talked about playing 54 games in a row once. Yeah, 54 I mean, games in a row. And and the travel was probably, a, you know, a little bit different of a situation for him too. The, the way that... The treatment that he was getting was probably a bit of a different situation as well. So that that has to be. Yeah, the treatment incredible. after a game Johnny Bench got was take a shower. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> take a shower, John. You're in there tomorrow. Maybe the Phillies with one of the, the few true backup catchers in Garrett Stubbs because JT Real Muto plays so many games for them defensively. Two strike pitches cut on and miss strike three. Eric Brito goes down and Paulo Espino strikes out three batters out of the four he faced to end the top of the sixth.
High scoring affair here in Dunedin 14 to 9 for the Phillies over the Blue Jays. This is a time for development in game one of spring training and a lot of the Blue Jays top development guys in camp right now. Ricky Tiedemann was slated to start today but did not but Arelvis Martinez the top position player prospect for ESPN that the Blue Jays have has already been seen today and we'll see him hit this inning and that's where he really earned some of that prospect cash in. Yeah, he's a very good power hitting prospect and you know what he's made some fast adjustments throughout the minor leagues and he's moved very quickly for a young player and you know he never really had to any problems once he got the triple A he made a nice adjustment there and ended up with just shy of 100 RBIs for the season. That's I mean at his age at triple A is really impressive you are really one of the younger guys in triple A if you're 21 like he was last year probably seven years younger than the league average yeah. and you're going to play against a lot of former major leaguers you're going to see some veteran pitchers like uh, Paolo Espino that type of pitcher and you're going to make some adjustments and the biggest adjustment he made was not trying to pull everything and, and I think he's got legit power you know I've said this before and I've said this a couple years ago I think eventually he's got the chance to be a power hitter along the lines of a George Bell. Wow, that is uh, quite the quite the accolade or guy to be beside a 1987 MVP and Martinez there with a five pitch walk. We talked about it earlier. That's been a big part of his maturity too. not swing. Not only what is he doing when he's swinging, but being OK to take a couple more pitches and let at bats come to him. Yeah, it's a learning process for sure, but he's uh, he's a guy that listens and takes instruction very well. He's going to be fine. Here's Leo Jimenez, another one of the major prospects for the Blue Jays. Um, and these young Latino players, they've got the benefit of having uh, Eddie Encarnacion here. And Edwin has been here, and he's talking to these young hitters. He's talking to all the hitters, of course, but he certainly has an impact when he's talking to some of his fellow Dominican players about approach it to play it about practice habits how you get better as a hitter and he's invaluable in his presence here in spring training and then it swings and fouls it back the shortstop took a big step forward last year at double a ended up hitting in the high 280s with an on base plus slugging above 800 went up to triple a at the end of the year and had a bit of trouble adjusting there but that was a pretty brief stint and very possible that we'll see him start at Triple A this year as he gets one off the handle, loops it towards right center. That'll drop in for a base hit. Martinez jogs into second, and the two Blue Jays prospects are aboard to start the inning. Yeah, right on time. We talk about the depth of the Blue Jays minor league system, and you're seeing some of these guys, and you, you just know that sooner or later you're going to be able to produce some more players coming out of their system, much like they did. Edwin Encarnacion, a terrific hitter in his playing days with the Blue Jays, and he wants to give back to these young players in the organization. So he makes an effort to get here to spring training and, and try to mentor some of these kids. Well, that's got to be so cool for the players as Britain takes up in a way 1 and 0. Oh. I mean, there are a lot of, of great Blue Jays that come around. Uh, you know, you see Devon White, Paul Quantrill, but to have a guy so recent as well involved in the success of this team a guy that a lot of these players probably watched when they were in high school or maybe a little bit before that and have him instructing them that's got to make a big impact yeah and you know what he had some terrific seasons for the blue jays began his career in cincinnati came over in a trade and really developed in you know what he went through some tough times to start his career too. He's actually sent back to the minor leagues from Toronto and went down and had the right attitude and worked hard and got his way back to the big leagues and ended up having some huge seasons for the Jays. And a similar thing happened with Teoscar Hernandez. He was sent down at one point came back up and, and kind of just racked up silver sluggers from that point on. So there's there's development even when you get to the big leagues not just when you're in the minor leagues as well. Another guy that's in camp and leaning on these young players is Victor Martinez, who's on the bench there. Fly ball lost to the side, and Zach Britton's going to reach safely there. 
That was a very awkward play for Shimon Muziani, who just got out there recently, and he just lost that ball for a moment, overran it down the left field line. This is the most challenging type of sky you could ever have. There's not a cloud in the sky. There's no depth perception. There's a little bit of breeze down there. And you can see he got overmatched from the start. I mean, he had no chance to make this play, and you can see no clouds at all. It's a endless sky, and you don't have much depth perception. Boy, once he got turned around, he had no chance. The Blue Jays went through their pop-up drills today before batting practice, and they were going through a similar thing where the ball's up in the air. You don't get a good beat on them early. You're never going to make a play. Ryan Servin up to the plate now. One ball, one strike count. Well, it's good practice for the regular season because this is, correct me if I'm wrong, a, a tougher sky than they'll face a lot of the time in Toronto. For sure. Servin charges the ball to left center field. That's going to split the outfielders and get down. Martinez scores. Jimenez scores. Getting the wave. Britain is coming home. There won't be a throw. And Brian Servin in his first swing in a Blue Jay uniform clears the bases with a double to left center. Well, that's a good feeling when you're in a new organization and you have an impacted bat early on. Danny Jansen started this game and Jansen had a couple of good at bats and here Servin gets his first at bat and clears the bases with a shot to the gap in left center. And that's a good swing he puts on it and the base running was outstanding. Everybody got a good read on the ball early and they clear the bases. Stuart Barroa squares and bunts it down the third base line, but it's foul. And it's 0 and 1. Servin definitely has some power. In Colorado, when he made his major league debut in 2022, he had two home runs as his first two hits. They came in the same game. He and Trevor Story, the only guys to do that, have each of their first two hits be homers in the same game. A one. Baroa takes downstairs one and one. Baroa, a free agent this season after spending a while in the minors with the Blue Jays, re signed on a minor league deal. The one one. High and outside. Yeah, he's an interesting guy. He's got some speed. He has played in the outfield. He played winter ball again in the Dominican Republic. And. He has played a lot of center field. He's played primarily center and left, but he's interesting in that he's got some speed and he's a switch hitter. He pops it up to left. Muziani fighting the sun, but makes the catch. And that's the first down of the inning. Let's go down to Hazel May. Ben, just a note on Barroa. He is in his eighth year with the Blue Jays organization, but this was his first ever invite to big league camp he said since 2021 he would be asked to come over from minor league camp to play in spring games with the blue jays but he said this is his first ever invite to big league camp he feels very comfortable in this setting but he's genuinely excited to get a, a, an official invite he told me to be with the big leaguers i asked him what the biggest jump in his game is over these eight years he said his mental side saying he understands how he can help the team particularly his running game that's his strength he says I feel powerful with my speed and when I'm stealing bases guys Hazel he stole 47 last year 47 the year before that and 58 the year before that so I, I tend to agree with him the speed is really his biggest weapon as Addison Barger is in an 0-2 hole yeah Burrow is interesting because of that speed skill Michael Mercado misses high and it's one and two well, Addison Barger, he's a guy that everybody's talking about is, is one of these guys is going to get a long look in the spring and he deserves it. Last year he had a little bit of an elbow issue, had some bone chips in his elbow and uh, he just hasn't had that kind of consistency you'd like to see. But he's got some power, he's got a terrific arm and primarily a third baseman. So he moved to the outfit a little bit, played outfield last year a bit. but. Another one of those guys are trying to see just exactly what they have in Addison Barger. Yeah, the, the word on him is third base and some right field. 
And he told me that it's been interesting learning from Isaiah Kiner Falefa because Barger started as a shortstop, so did IKF. So he can relate a little bit to Isaiah in learning that way. Blue Jays score a trio of runs and look to tie it up when we come back. A great matchup on Hockey Night in Canada later today. Best in the East versus best in the West. Bruins Canucks 6.30 Eastern, 3.30 Pacific on Sportsnet Pacific and City TV. Down south in Dunedin, Florida. The Blue Jays down by two right now with a runner on second base, Brian Servin, who cleared the bases a moment ago. And the new pitcher is Carlos Francisco, the tall right-hander for Philadelphia. He takes on Luis De Los Santos, first plate appearance of the game for De Los Santos. 1-0 is outside. Ben Schulman, Buck Martinez, and Hazel May. And De Los Santos getting up to AAA for part of the year last season. Very outgoing young man. You see him around the clubhouse, and he's anxious to engage you in a conversation. Interesting guy. He's got some power. Terrific body. He looks like he's got a chance to really develop into a pretty good player. His first chance to be in camp with the Blue Jays. Hit three grand slams last season. As he takes a pitch inside to go to three and one. He hit a 10th inning walk off grand slam against the Worcester Red Sox in June. Then a week later, he hit another grand slam, and then he hit a third in September. The Blue Jays had two last year. He had three. And he takes a five pitch walk to keep the inning alive. Now Rafael Antigua is coming up to the plate here. Another very interesting prospect for the Blue Jays, uh, who, you know, in the old Marcus Stroman adage, the height doesn't matter measure heart. Well, he has more pop in that bat than you might think when you first look at him. Yeah, and you know what? You see his numbers from a year ago, you go, wow, 305, 12, and 85. That's pretty good numbers. And then you see him, and, and you say, wow, it up. a little uh, power in that small package. Shortstop went out to make the play, and that will do it. The Blue Jays scored three runs in the bottom of the sixth and make it a two-run game headed to the seventh.
Day one of the Blue Jays promotions launch features bobbleheads on May 22nd. The first 15,000 fans will receive a Yusei Kikuchi bobblehead. Check out that signature leg kick. Visit BlueJays.com slash promotions to learn more. Kikuchi a couple times last year was toe to the sky with his leg kick. Almost kicked himself in the face a few times. But what a phenomenal season. He had last year after struggling to stay in the rotation in his first year. He was incredibly valuable to the Blue Jays in 2023. Yeah, he sure was, and he really refined his delivery. He added a curveball, and this year he's throwing a changeup. So it's going to be interesting to see how he progresses. This is Mason Fluharty. Vancouver in double A in 48 games. He put up some pretty good numbers as well. He gets a swing and a miss to start the inning. He doesn't throw a straight fastball. That's his fastball right there, and it cuts. And he runs it out there, and he's got a lot of movement on it. Cutter slider, that's all he throws. Very effective. Another pitch off the plate outside. You can see a lot of run. That's got to be really challenging for left-handed hitters facing through Hardy. Cal Stevenson, who's played in parts of a couple major league seasons, the left-handed hitter at the plate. Stevenson fights it off and is it because that similar shape that similar movement in the cutter and slider that he's so effective you think I think so and it's hard it's, it's a very flat cutter it's not like that normal cutter that you see some people call a slider a cutter but his is legitimately a, a cutter with flat movement across the plane of the bat pretty interesting and like I said this this pitching staff in the camp including these younger players they're all pretty interesting another guy that's going to be interesting to watch is Adam Mako yes. who pitched at Vox Hall in Calgary and he's got an interesting story another left-hander that has been a starter in the past he's from Slovakia and he was picked up when the Blue Jays picked up Eric Swanson it wasn't the most talked about part of the deal because Tay Oscar and Swanson obviously dominated the headlines but Mako an interesting guy for the Blue Jays going forward Here's Flew Hardy, the fifth rounder out of Liberty. Gets another foul ball from Stevenson. Reached Triple A late in May in 2023. It's the ninth Blue Jay pitcher to pitch here this afternoon. Yeah. Well, we've had 26 runs and in six innings from these two teams combined. A one two in the dirt. Cool and flew hard. He got drafted in 2022. He posted a picture. Lots of guys in their little leagues. You know, the teams are named after major league teams. And he actually played for the Blue Jays as a kid, was the name of his little league team. And he posted a picture of him and his dad currently with Blue Jays hats on, and then them when he was his coach and they were kids. And that was in the silver and black era, uh, a different logo. But uh, it, being a Blue Jay for a long time, so Flew Hardy's comfortable in these threads. Yeah, that's cool. A couple of Blue Jays in the minor league system also were Creighton Blue Jays. Yeah. Including Will Robertson, who makes the catch right there. Played at Creighton in Omaha. Alan Roden is in the other Creighton Blue Jays, so they're a couple of Blue Jay farmhands that have been Blue Jays in the past. Two exciting outfielders. Robertson had about as strong of a second half as anyone in the system last year. And parlay that into a strong campaign in the Arizona Fall League, too. Former Blue Jay draft pick Trevor Schwecki up. Flew Hardy jams him. Pop up to shallow left center. Jimenez going out, and he made the catch. Nice play there by Leo Jimenez. Had to fight the sun on a tough angle and helps out his pitcher, Flew Hardy. There are two down. Uh, you'd mention what a good fielder that Jimenez is, and there you see the skills on display. That was another tough pop-up, this tough sky today with a little bit of breeze blowing here in Dunedin, but he stayed with it made a nice play. So two outs for Flew Hardy, who gets another left-handed hitter in Bryce Ball. First pitch, swing and a miss. Tons of movement on that slide. Well, and two, he works from the extreme first base side of the rubber to compound the challenges for left-handed hitters. Yeah, he's pounding the strikes, and I love his tempo. 
He is working quickly, keeping the pressure on the hitter. And he took a little bit off that slider. It looked like that was down to 78 before it was a little bit more 81. You see how far out on that rubber, just the, basically the heel of his left foot engaged with the rubber. Tough angle for hitters. 0-2, swing and a miss, strike three. One, two, three, inning for Fluharty. And we go to the seventh inning stretch in a tight ball game. 14-12 Phillies in day one of spring training 2024. UFC fight night action continues tonight in Mexico. Main card action begins at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific on Sportsnet Plus and Sportsnet 360 with a new season brings some of the same. Our first OK Blue Jays of the year here in Dunedin. Speaking of UFC, by the way, the uh, the Blue Jays, a lot of them going through some new training methods. And for Bo Bichette, there was a new training method. He was doing some Muay Thai. Now, he wasn't actually fighting people. He wanted to make sure that we knew. But uh, he did some swimming, some Pilates. Were there any any unorthodox training methods that you tried uh, in your time playing? I did a lot of aerobics. OK. A lot of aerobics at the end of my career. And uh, yeah, just trying to stay loose. and. Of course, back then when I was playing, Nautilus was a big thing. It was a workout routine based on machines and all that stuff. So there were a lot of things that we did. A little bit different than today. We didn't have any weights, that's for sure. Oh. Zero weights. Yeah. Not until the late 70s. Nobody lifted weights. They were banned from the club. I think about that yep. now. I mean, it's such a huge part of it these days. Here's Andrew Bellotti delivering to Will Robertson. Takes it off the end of the mat foul. One and one. The aerobics were helpful though, you thought, or not? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, when I was, especially when I was coming back from a broken leg, I did that just to get movement back and everything else. But yeah, Bo, he did a nice job. A lot of swimming in his off-season routine and Mutai. He just got away from baseball for a while, something he hadn't been for a while. This is Will Robertson. We mentioned he played at Creighton University in Omaha. He is from Missouri. Loose Creek, Missouri, a small town in Missouri. One, two is chopped to the right side. It'll be scooped up by Burrito at second, who flips over the ball at first. Robertson retired. So we get our second look at Arelvis Martinez, who did not have a full swing in his first at bat. He had a check swing, but took a five pitch walk. The top position player prospect in the system per ESPN. And one of, if not the top, top power hitters as well. He swings at the first pitch this time and hooks it down to third. And Martinez retired on the first pitch. 
Yeah, a little anxious there. Obviously, he didn't get a chance to straighten the bat his first time up and went after kind of a questionable pitch. And that will probably listen to the conversation with Don Mattingly saying, is that the pitch you wanted to hit in that situation? Maybe a case where he knows he might not get another at bat. And so he just got a little bit over anxious. Two down now. And Leo Jimenez up. He made a pretty nice catch going over his shoulder in the top half of the seventh. Pilate fires home, and it's called strike one. Pilate's pitched in the majors with a couple of teams, originally with the Rays. Here's the 0-1. Fouled back into the netting. It's nothing and two. Yeah, if you've played a few years in the majors, there's a chance that you have pitched with the Rays at some point. Yeah. They make <laughs> changes all the time. We're going to see them here in the not too distant future as they come into Dunedin to play. The Rays, they will be here on the 7th of March. And the Rays are one of the only teams in baseball where they've lost several key players and people are projecting them to be just as good, if not better, because they just keep doing it year after year. Yeah, they've got a formula that works very well. You can see Brandon Eichert working to get ready to come into this game. Broken back grounder hits softly to short, charging in Schwecki and his throw there to beat Jimenez. A one, two, three, bottom of the seven. Baseball is back and the weather is beautiful in Florida. Sunny skies for spring training 2024. Year after year, the Toronto Blue Jays play in about the toughest division in baseball. The AL East was loaded last year, and if anything, Buck, it looks like it could be even tougher this year if the Yankees can be resurgent. How do you think the Blue Jays stack up here in the AL East? Yeah, I think they stack up very well. In my mind, the Blue Jays have the best pitching staff in the East, starters and relievers. I, I don't think there's any question about that. The Orioles have had a couple of setbacks already with their starting pitching. The Yankees are counting on Carlos Rodon and Marcus Stroman. And, you know, of course, they got the big guy at the top of the order in Garrett Cole. But when you look at their rotation, Clark Schmidt is four. Nestor Cortez, he was a big question mark last year, and we don't know what he's going to do. Of course, the uh, Orioles, they don't have Felix Bautista. He underwent Tommy John surgery. John Means has got elbow soreness. Kyle Bradish has got elbow problems. That's a big loss. And he might be out. He might not pitch at all. So, yeah, there's a lot of question marks in this division. But I, I think at the same time, when you look at three teams, 89 or higher win totals, the Blue Jays, yeah, it was a disappointing season, but they won 89 games. I mean, if you improve that by five games, you're up in 94, 95 territory, and all of a sudden, then, you know, I think the biggest thing for John Snyder is trying to win a division. I think you win a division, of course, it gives you that off 
period. You aren't playing a wild card series. You can get a little rest and set up your rotation a little bit better. But he and Pete Walker, I, I think they understand. They've got a chance to win a division. I think that's their goal. I don't think they want to get to the playoffs. You win a division, then you are in a much better position to go deep into the postseason. Yeah, they've made the playoffs three out of the last four years, but every time from a wild card spot and haven't been able to advance past that round. And Brandon Isert in the game, by the way, the left-hander with a strikeout of Matt Kroon to start his outing. This is upstairs, and, and speaking of the AL East, Baltimore and Boston played today with Baltimore hosting, and Corbin Burns was seen for the first time in an Orioles uniform. He pitched a scoreless inning and struck out a pair, and the Orioles won that game 4-3. to three. Isert induces a pop-up here, middle of the diamond. Jimenez is going to call off his minor league teammate in Martinez and make the catch. There are two outs. Isert is a pretty interesting guy for the Blue Jays. Yeah, he pitched very well last year at AAA. He appeared in 459 games in AAA Buffalo and pitched 69 innings and had a pretty good, pretty good season, a whip of just 132. And he too is kind of an interesting left-hander, and they've got a bunch of guys. And I mentioned Adam Mako. Hopefully, we'll see him in the next couple of days. And he's probably got more starting potential than both Little and Iser. Iser, maybe though a depth option for a lefty reliever. Should the Blue Jays need another one, he misses outside to Muziati, two and zero. Yeah, I think Little and Iser are probably the guys they will think first and foremost of to back up Cabrera and Meza. 2-0 is off the handle toward right field. That's a catch for Robertson and a 1-2-3 inning for Brandon Isert. The Blue Jays pitchers flying through the last three frames. They're looking for a two-run comeback. Don't miss Kevin Gosman bobblehead day. The inspiration for this bobblehead came from Gosman's routine of tossing his gum after each inning. It's only available to the first 15,000 fans on Wednesday, July 3rd. Visit bluejays.com slash promotions to secure your tickets. Bottom of the eighth inning. Fun day here as we open up spring training for the Blue Jays at TD Ballpark in Dunedin. Ben Schulman, Buck Martinez, and Hazel May. And on the mound right now, a new pitcher for the Phillies. It's the right-hander, Jose Ruiz. First pitch taken by Zach Britton, called strike one. Seventeen games in AAA for Ruiz, and then okay with a 238 opponent's batting average. He's got a good fastball, and you see it again with late movement down and away. That might have been more of a changeup than his fastball. And Ruiz started the year at the major league level, was traded from the White Sox to the Diamondbacks. Check swing there by Britton. He did go around on the appeal. 
So it's one and two. Dan I has shown you down at third. Ruiz trying to get back to the majors where he's made over 200 appearances. Britain with a little bit of a Soto shuffle there as he takes the pitch low. It's two balls and two strikes. Zach, not to be confused with the dominant closer for the Orioles and reliever for the Yankees for a bit, but he pokes it toward the mound and it's fielded by Ruiz who flips over to first one out. Second chance for Brian Servant and last time he was up he thumped the ball to left center field cleared the bases it was a three run double and that's why the Blue Jays are down 14 to 12 right now because of Servant's big extra base hit. Matt Servant came up with a big hit. You see his numbers last year in AAA, 38 games. He's now 28 years old, originally drafted out of Arizona State. He's got some time in the big leagues, both in 22 and 23. Got a big chunk of playing time in 2022 with the Rockies when he was in 62 games and hit six home runs and drove in 16. Played 11 games last year, saw his minor league numbers before, spent most of the year at AAA Albuquerque. He checks his swing and did not go around. So it's two balls and one strike. Servin and Henry and Lockers beside each other seem to have a pretty good bond. Peyton Henry, the other catcher that came over from another organization that could be in the running. I mean, there's Phil Clark, too, who's been in the organization for a couple years out of Vanderbilt. He could be a guy that the Blue Jays could look to for a depth catching option. TJ Brock warming up for Toronto. 2-2 Two -two in the dirt, full count. Now, Peyton Henry, too, is kind of interesting. He's just 26 years old. He's got some big league time. Played with Miami the last two seasons. Well, actually, 21 and 22. Didn't get any big league time last year. But he got a little taste of big league pitching. Line shot on a hop to second. Picked up by Brito. It knocked him back into the outfield, but he still makes the play. Two pieces of strong contact for Servin. There are two outs here in the bottom of the eighth. Watch out, that second baseman gets knocked back on his heels on that big hop, but he's able to right himself, plant his feet, and make a good throw to greet time serving. Now, Stuart Baroa, second chance at the plate, flight out to left field in the sixth. Went around on that one, called strike anyway, 0 and 1. Back and forth offensive ball game, although after 26 runs in the first six innings, no one has scored for the last couple innings. I don't know if I call it a pitcher's duel at this point, but it, the offense has slowed down a little bit recently. Well, they got a lot of the regulars out of the lineup. Yeah, and that makes a big difference. And the Blue Jays got three runs in the first inning. Don Marshall had a two run double in the first inning, and they just have slowed down now since the minor leaguers have taken over a bit. Yeah, it was really Bo, Turner, Danny Jansen, and Farsho, Isaiah Kiner Falefa, too, who drove a lot of the offense for the Blue Jays today. Two one pitch a little bit low. Good eye by Baroa. Be fun if he gets on. We had mentioned it last time around, but he's one of the best base stealers the Blue Jays have. Swiped 47 backs each of the last two minor league seasons. Swing and a miss, full count. With Addison Barger waiting on deck. Ruiz, the right hander in the set. And the 3 2. Check swing tapper foul. Ruiz bailed out there as Barroa accidentally makes contact. Ready for the 3 2 again, and he's aboard. 
Hard work and plate appearance there to keep the bottom of the eighth alive. Now in two, it brings a tie run to the plate. I mean, that's a big two out walk right there. And that's what the Blue Jays want to emphasize. Hey, know who you are, know where you are in the lineup, and know who's batting behind you because Barge has got some power, and Barrow did a good job of getting the two out walk. Second chance at the plate for Barger struck out on a pitch in the dirt in the sixth. Called strike one. You had mentioned the injury for Barger last year. He started the year a little bit slow because of it, then got really, really hot in the middle of the season. But it'd be nice for him to have a, a less interrupted year as the runner takes off. There'll be no throw, and it wouldn't have really mattered if there was one anyway. Baroa takes the base easily. On a pitch that was low, and there's a runner in scoring position for Addison Barger. Yep, he certainly got a big jump over at first base. A great acceleration, and you can see he gets the top speed after a full stride. Easy stolen base for Barroa. Now potentially a single could score a run as the pitch is outside. Barger ahead in the count. Bobichet had a stolen base back in the third inning. Bo had a good day, had a couple of hits, stolen base, scored a pair of runs. Oh, big backswing there. Looked like it might have hit the catcher. It's a swinging strike, and it's two and two. What's the backswing of Barger? He might have cut the catcher's bit on that long extended backswing. Takes a pitch there to get it to a full count. Barger impressed last spring with some big home runs for the Blue Jays. A long ball here would tie up the game. 3 2 pitch. Runner takes off and it's fouled back into the netting. If you're stealing third with two outs, you better make sure you're going to make yeah. it. Yeah, base running last year, that was a big problem for the Blue Jays. They ran into a lot of silly outs. Trying to advance on ground balls to the left side of the infield from second to third and just made too many mistakes on the bases. You got to cut out those mistakes. Ball four. Outside, ball four. And yeah, Barroa not forced, so it wasn't like some sort of 3 2 start the runner. That was a legit steal, and the Blue Jays last year did commit more unforced outs at third base than any other team in baseball. Back to back walks with two outs. And now the go ahead run is at the plate. Luis de los Santos with a potential here to give the Blue Jays the lead. Mentioned it the last time he was up. He's hit some big home runs, including three grand slams last year. He swings and shoots the first pitch down the right field line. Foul. 0 and 1. De los Santos, first camp as. Participant with the Blue Jays, but he's actually had a lot of spring training at bats going back to 2019. He has had 20 spring training at bats just as a fill in extra kid from the minor leagues. For those who don't know the distinction, two separate spring training camps at the same facility, but for major leaguers and for minor leaguers, but then you can still get minor leaguers to come play in games. The Blue Jays have had a couple guys do that today. Big cut and a miss by De Los Santos. And it's one and two. I don't think minor league spring training camp is open yet. I think it's the early camp. Yeah. It's still open. Yeah. There's a lot of players in early camp, and they've been here since the 5th of February. You're, you're in competition, maybe not to make the big club this year, but to move up spots. So, yeah, there, there's a ton of guys that are already there. Yeah, the higher prospects. Runners go a double steal, but a swing and a miss anyway. Ends the eighth inning. Headed to the ninth on what's been a very fun day so far in Dunedin, not just on the field as well. It's the opener of spring training 2024.
Day one of the Blue Jays promotions launch features bobbleheads. April 12th, the first 15,000 fans receive a Jose Barrios gold glove bobblehead. Visit BlueJays.com slash promotions to learn more. Remember when bobbleheads used to be a doll with a big head on it? <laughs> <laughs> now they got all kinds of things to add into it. A pile of bubble gum for the Kevin Gosman, a gold glove for Berea. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Jose Bautista one last year had a levitating bat for the bat flip. As TJ Brock is into the game now, pitching for the Blue Jays in the top of the ninth. But yeah, the bobblehead game has been revolutionized in the last couple of years. I got a bobblehead at Candlestick Park back in the 60s and it was a straight up doll with a great big head on it and a big spring. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Things are changing. You know, TD Ballpark renovated a couple years ago. Rogers Center going through more renovations to be completed soon. As Brock we gets hope. ahead in the count. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's I'm on the phone with beautiful. the construction manager right now. What I have seen, it's really spectacular. It's changed into a baseball park. Carlos De La Cruz goes down swinging, and T.J. Brock off to a good start. Uh, Brock's got a sinker and a slider. He throws the ball very hard. His first pitch of this inning was 94 miles an hour with good movement. He's from Cincinnati and pitched at Ohio State. And he's a pretty interesting guy as well. And you think about where he was last year. He pitched a double A at the end of the season, made 32 appearances. And he didn't give up much. He's a guy that's going to be interesting because he's got such good movement on his fastball. And he likes to throw strikes as well. Foul back there from Kendall Simmons and Brock ahead once again, 0 and 2. And he was closing a lot of games last year. Ended up with 13 saves and finished 32 games in the minors. Yeah. O2. Off the end of the bat, a looper towards short over the head of Jimenez down in left field. A base hit for Kendall Simmons. Yeah, that breaking ball right off the end of the bat. They got enough of it just to flare it into left field. But I like the way that T.J. Brock works quickly on the mound. You can see that breaking ball just at the end of the bat. And fortunately for that Kendall Simmons, he was able to get it into left field. One out single. Eric Brito first pitch swinging. It's the ball hard and a beautiful play made down the left field line. Doesn't count for an out, but it should. It's 0-1. That'll make the highlight film. It's hard ball hit down the line. The ball boy's right on it. He is all over it. Makes a good play. Oh, one chopped in front of the plate. Picked up by Brock, and he'll make the throw over to first. There are two down. Let's go to Hazel down on the field. Ben, I had a nice conversation with T.J. Brock, who told me Jordan Romano has gone above and beyond, gone out of his way to answer any and all of Brock's questions. He said uh, it's meant a great deal to him here in his first big league camp. He said, that's where I want to be. I want to be an all-star closer for a big league team one day. Guys? You know, all of these guys on this pitching staff are so free with their time and their expertise. They pass on their experience to these young kids. And it's a familiar theme that you just heard from Hazel that a lot of the kids have really been impressed with how quickly big leaguers are to share their information with them. That probably creates a good impact environment where they're going to ask more questions of these guys. Well, and a lot of things, too, that because the big league staff is pretty well set, they're all pretty confident yeah. in their jobs, yeah. so they're anxious to help out the kids coming behind them. Pitch delivered here by Brock in the zone, two and one. And yeah, T.J. Brock could have a great year. Jordan Romano probably isn't worried about his job security, you know, as an all-star closer right now for the Blue Jays. 2-1 cut on and missed. And Brock with a chance here to end the inning. But you can see how confident Brock is, how quickly he toes the rubber, looks for the sign. He's anxious to keep the pressure on the hitter like that. Brock into the set. 2-2 Two -two count against Cal Stevenson. The pitch. <laughs> Called strike three. A pair of K's for T.J. Brock, and the Blue Jays go to the bottom of the ninth, down two in the spring training opener.
A wild back and forth opener to the spring training schedule. 26 total runs, a double digit run inning from the Phillies. But there are some pitching highlights in this game. And if you go back to the beginning, Chad Dallas got the start for the Blue Jays. Ricky Tina in a late scratch. Dallas a big prospect, and he was impressive. By. Well, he sure was impressive. He did a good job of throwing just 11 pitches. He retired the first three batters of the game with a couple of strikeouts and he's an interesting young prospect in camp. He's got a chance to start out in triple A as a starter for the Bisons and you know there have been a lot of pitchers. We now will see the 19th pitcher of this game here in the bottom of the ninth inning. But I think John Schneider has some highlights of this game despite the kind of lopsided offensive tone to this ball game. If you're doing the math along with us at home. There are only 18 half innings in nine innings, and there have been 19 pitchers in this game. So it has been quite the carousel so far, especially on the Blue Jays' side. And here is Tyler McKay against Rafael Lantigua. Called strike to even up the count at one and one. Lantigua in his second at bat of the day. Swings and misses. It's one and two. Popped up to short in the sixth. Yeah, he got fooled by that slider right there. That's one of those breaking balls that people have a tendency to call a sweeper. That flat breaking ball that runs away from the right handed hitters. Called strike three. Funky motion from McKay, and he freezes Lantigua for the first out. Yeah, that's that breaking ball again. That one looked like it backed up, started like it was going to break off the plate, but stayed on the outside corner for the strike, huh? So here's Will Robertson, left-handed hitting outfielder. Checked his swing at ball one. I mentioned Robertson's from Missouri, a small town south of Jefferson City. I said, you know where Taos is? He goes, you mean Tom Hankey's home? <laughs> Another small town by Jefferson City, Missouri, so he's well aware of Hinky's birthplace and his home, Taos, Missouri. It's a, a unique connection to the Blue Jays you wouldn't think of very often. 2-0, lifted down the left field line, long run, Muziani, and that lands in fair territory. Robertson with a wide turnaround first is going to head back. He's a guy who... Through the first half of the year last year, over 50 games, was hitting in the 180s, and in the second half, he hit over 300, more than doubled his extra base hit count. And the director of player development, Joe Sclafani, said, quote, from June on, if you look at his numbers, he had as good, if not the best second half of anyone in the Blue Jays system. Yeah, he's an interesting guy. The Blue Jays haven't really had a good run of developing outfielders. When you think about it, you know, maybe Alex Rios, the lost really everyday outfield that they have developed. Vernon Wells as well. Runner going, pitch was low, and the throw down wide. Robertson with the stolen base. I mean, it, you know, different kind of player, but Kevin Pillar came from their system in the late, late rounds of the draft. Yep. Good jump at first base, another stolen base. Burrow had a steal back at the eighth. Bo had a stolen base in the third. Fly ball lifted to right field. Going back, and it's caught at the wall. Martinez nearly tied this game up. Or no, it wasn't. The ball's still in play, and the Blue Jays score a run. The right fielder dropped the ball after he caught it. And Martinez is going to be out. But Carlos Fabulous did a great job, and you got to compliment Will Robertson, the base runner from second, because it was caught. Fabulous saw it was caught, but then when he, the outfielder took the ball out of his glove, he dropped it. But watch Will Robertson here, the base runner. The ball is going to be caught by the right fielder right here. He catches it, but then he drops it. And Robertson tagged it second, and Fabulous waved him around third. And good on Robertson to keep his eye on the coach. You assume it's just going to be a routine out, but watch Robertson here. He's looking at the coach, and the coach says, go home. He dropped it. And the Blue Jays steal a run right there. 
So that is a two-base sacrifice fly. Good eye from you on that one. It's a one-run game and a ground ball to short. Throw across the diamond, and Jimenez, the final out for the Blue Jays in a 14-13 opener to spring training. If you missed baseball, this game gave you a double dose of it in the first game back for spring training. Well, it sure did. 27 runs on 29 hits, and the Blue Jays didn't hit a home run, but they hung in there, had some good at-bats, and there were some bright spots on the pitching staff. But overall, not a bad game to start. And right now, John Snyder is acknowledging Carlos Fabulous in the dugout for a heads up job of coaching right there in the bottom of the ninth inning to score that run from second base on an out to right field. Terrific job by Carlos Fabulous. Yeah, he stole a run for the Blue Jays, and the Blue Jays in general did a ton offensively today, even if they didn't pick up a win. We'll be back tomorrow. The Blue Jays take on the Yankees at one and then return home on Monday. Appreciate you tuning in for game one of spring training 2024.